Good afternoon. My name is Helen Rosenthal, and I chair the Committee on Women. Chair Eugene uh, of the Committee on Human Rights will make a statement just as soon as I'm finished here today, and I'm so glad we're doing this hearing together. We are here today to commit ourselves to ending sexual harassment in the city of New York. For the more than 330,000 municipal employees, and for all those who work in New York City. This hearing will be the first of many aimed at making that commitment a reality. Today we will examine the city's existing policies, both for its own workforce and for the private sector. We know we have strong sexual harassment protections on the books under federal, state, and local law. We know that the city charter lays out detailed procedures to ensure a safe and respectful workplace. But we also know that in far too many cases, reality has not caught up with the law. Survivors of sexual harassment are still too often unsure of their rights, let alone of how to safely assert them. Bystanders are still too often uncertain of their responsibilities, let alone how they can intervene. Accordingly, harassers are still too often able to operate with impunity. As recently as 2016, a Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission report found that just 7 to 13 percent of survivors of sexual harassment ever file a complaint, let alone find justice. That legacy of underreporting gets us to the reason our committees are holding this hearing now. The reason we are approaching this issue with such urgency can be summed up in three words. Hashtag me Two, countless women and men have raised their voices and built the hashtag MeToo movement. The courage and grace of these survivors demand a reckoning, not just for the powerful individuals finally brought to account, but for our society as a whole. We owe them a great deal of gratitude, and more to the point, we owe them action. Today, the committees will consider a package of legislation that represents a first step toward comprehensively addressing sexual harassment for those who work in New York City. Twelve bills are being introduced and discussed that expand protections, confront flawed processes, and establish new mechanisms for accountability. I want to personally thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership and partnership in pulling this package together. Meeting the Me Too moment means moving past the temptation to quickly check a box. Instead, we must commit ourselves to the long, hard work of confronting old attitudes and crafting new policy. And that starts with listening. The committees want to hear the vo stories of workers in the public and private sectors, and we want to hear from the city about the number of complaints and the outcomes and the good work that they are already doing. Women have raised their voices and demanded action before. The testimony of Anita Hill in the early 90s describing the hostile work environment created by Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas introduced the term sexual harassment to the nation and sparked an unprecedented public conversation. Here in New York in 1993, Comptroller Elizabeth Holtzman audited <clears throat> the city's sexual harassment policies. The audit exposed the city's policy as completely inadequate to protect the rights of survivors. There was one agency that was willing to even comply at that time for an audit, the Department of Transportation, and the audit revealed not many complained and those who, were, who complained were then harassed 
and forced or chose forcibly to leave. Just as the work began then, the issue was allowed to fade away. Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the Supreme Court. That would never happen today. The controller's audit touched only on the Department of Transportation, but her work was resisted by all city agencies, and her term of office ended. The public conversation moved on. We cannot allow it to fade away again. Instead, we must take responsibility for crafting the most comprehensive, most survivor-centered, and most holistic anti-sexual harassment policy and procedures in the country. As the largest employer in New York, this starts with the city getting its own house in order and leading the way. Each and every one of our more than 330,000 employees is entitled to a safe and respectful workplace, and we must do more to guarantee it. Progress has certainly been made in the 25 years since Elizabeth Holtzman's audit. The Equal Employment Practices Commission's multiple audits now of the Department of Transportation in the intervening years, for instance, reveal significant changes to their complaint process. We will hear more today about the steps that have been taken. We all acknowledge, though, that critical gaps still remain. In terms of training, employee engagement, and most importantly, accountability, more must be done. As has been reported in recent weeks, the city, while it has a centralized, easily accessible database, may not quite be ready yet to uh, announce it's the accumulated information of complaints and results. And we know, and we'll hear from them today, that they're taking strides to move the ball forward with that. Better practices do exist. California's Los Angeles County seems to be ahead of the curve. Since the county initiated its comprehensive plan in 2011, employee litigation costs have been cut in half. LA County has found success by emphasizing that complaints can be submitted to an independent age entity rather than an employee's own agency and by ensuring that their policy of mandatory reporting by supervisors of sexual harassment incidents is enforced with reprimands and fines. And the county is still working to improve its process. Just this year, legislators announced the creation of a new survey that will go to complainants to gauge satisfaction with the process. As we move forward, New York City must explore taking additional steps like these and others. And as we lead the way for our own workforce, we must ensure that no one is left behind. This means adding protections and policies for those in the private sector as well, making sure that all workers know their rights and know how to access the resources that they need. As Moira Donegan wrote recently, it is still explosive, radical, and productively dangerous for women to say what we really mean. I think the Me Too movement has demonstrated a power in making our voices heard. As policymakers, it is time for us to listen. Today we will hear from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, responsible for the city's equal employment opportunity policy, as well as the New York City Commission on Human Rights, responsible for enforcing the city's human rights protections for both the public and private sectors. We will also hear from the Equal Employment Practices Commission, 
the independent body tasked by the New York City Charter with monitoring the city's compliance with equal employment laws, as well as many advocacy groups and experts. I want to thank everyone here at the Council who worked nonstop uh, for making this hearing possible, including my legislative director, Sean Fitzpatrick, and my women's issues intern, uh, Amina Shikupilwa. And I also want to thank Tears and Nasser's entire team in the Council's Human Services Division, including Aminta Kilawan, Council to the Committee on Women, Council Malcolm um, Butehorn, Balkis Mihirig, Council to the Committee on Hu Civil and Human Rights, Policy Analysts, Chloe Rivera and Joan Povoloni, Legal Fellow, Rabia Kasim, and Finance Analyst, Sheila Johnson and Daniel Krupp. I want to especially thank the team for their work on the committee report, which is an invaluable resource I urge everyone to go online and read. So I'd like to welcome uh, Public Advocate Tish James, Council Member Diana Aiea, Council Member Mark Levine, Council Member Danny Drum, and I'd like to ask um, Council Member Eugene uh, first to make his introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Co-Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the Chair of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I'd like to uh, thank my colleague, Chair Rosenthal, for taking the lead on this very important topic, sexual harassment, best practices, and policies in New York City. This is the first hearing for both of our committees in this session. And I'm proud that uh, we are joining the important uh, societal conversation about sexual harassment and assault as precipitated by Me Too campaign. By way of statistic in New York City, the Commission on Human Rights reported uh, that the investigation into sexual harassment increases by nearly 50% over the last two years, with 109, 109 claims filed during the 2015-2016 period, as compared to 73 during the 2013 and 14 period. As of December 2017, the CCHR <coughs> investigated 340 complaints of gender discrimination, of which 40% are claims of sexual and gender-based harassment, and 85% of which are workplace-related. The sheer pervasiveness of this issue has highlighted the need to re-examine and reform several industries, including our political and governmental institution. At this hearing today, the Council hopes to examine what New York City can do better and gather input on this important package of sexual harassment legislation. The City of New York is the largest employer in the New York City. We stand to lead by example and set standards that will serve as a benchmark citywide and perhaps even nationwide. Currently, New Yorkers has recourse to several agencies to report sexual harassment at the federal, state, and local levels. Several entities exist within the city that address sexual harassment including two agencies which my committee oversees, the City Commission on Human Rights and the Equal Employment Practices Commission. New York City has the most comprehensive human rights code in the country. An individual can make complaint to CCHR for free. City employees can make a complaint to the Equal Employment Opportunities Officer or contact the CCHR, person to the city charter, the Department of City-wide Administration Services, DCAS, has developed an equal employment opportunity policy as well as standards 
and procedures for city agencies to implement DCAS and the city's legal obligation. The Equal Employment Practices Commission is tasked with monitoring compliance by auditing city agencies to ensure that they are implementing city policies and co complying with federal, state, and local laws. As chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee, it is my goal during this legislative session to work with CCHR and the EEPC, as well as other relevant mayoral offices and city agencies to ensure that our city is doing all that it can to root out sexual harassment and all perpetrators accountable. I look forward to hearing testimony today and collaborating with the relevant city agencies, advocacy groups, academics, and other stakeholders to ensure that New York City adopts effective laws and policies to combat sexual harassment and assault. And I would like to take the opportunity also to thank each one and all of you here and all the wonderful person from the great city, from the city council, who work together to make this uh, possible. And again, thank you to all of you, including my colleagues and the wonderful public advocate. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Now I turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Wozenton. Thank you so much, Dr. Eugene. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm gonna ask Council Member Levine actually to make some remarks because I know you have another hearing to attend. Well, thank you to both our co-chairs. I'm pleased to be one of the sponsors of the bills today. Um, I have to say I can't think of a moment where it was more important that we had strong leadership from the Women's Committee and we're very lucky to have Chair Rosenthal in that role. Um, Councilmember John and I were just lamenting the dearth of men in this chamber right now. Um, and it, it is important that, that men uh, own this epidemic and that we speak out about it and not flinch from the ugly truths that are emerging. Uh, I also think it's important that uh, we men not uh, um, be overly verbose in this debate as we tend to be, and I'm gonna try and model that behavior by being br very brief myself, uh, and, and, and just observing that um, at a time when we're seeing the epidemic of sexual harassment playing out in Hollywood and Congress, we <coughs> would be dangerously naive to think that we were immune from it here in the city of New York, uh, a city government with 325,000 employees. Uh, it's remarkable how few cases have made it into the headlines uh, in this tabloid-driven town, uh, but we know, as painful as it is to acknowledge, that sexual harassment is a reality uh, faced by far too many victims in our city government. And we need to shine a light on that. We need to get the facts, and the bill that I'm introducing would help to do that by requiring uh, our city to report agency by agency every year on the number, number of sexual harassment complaints filed with HR, uh, the number of cases where a discrimination process is commenced, uh, number of cases in which uh, a determination is made, whether they're substantiated, what sanctions are applied, um, how many cases are dropped because uh, the victim uh, recants or refuses to go forward with the case. Uh, this information we've never had as policymakers, we've never had it as the public. Uh, it will not have any personal identification, but it will give us a chance to confront the scale of the problem in the city, to hold ourselves accountable for solving it. Um, and we believe to direct good policy going forward. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair, to both our co-chairs. Thank you. Uh, also, I'd like to ask the public advocate, who's also um, sponsor of one of the bills, to give some words now as well. I want to thank um, the uh, co-chairs for holding this um, hearing, Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Eugene. I am uh, one of the prime sponsors of T2018-1463. The bill would mandate that all private employers with 15 or more employees must conduct annual anti-sexual harassment training. Supervisors and managerial employees of such employer shall receive additional training 
focusing on the specific responsibilities of those employees in the prevention of sexual harassment and retaliation and measures they may take to appropriately address sexual harassment complaints. The New York City Commission on Human Rights, in order to help employees meet this mandate, would also be responsible for creating a series of online interactive training modules to be posted on their website for access by employers. We will no longer allow women to be diminished, to be objectified, to be subjects of harassment, direct propositions for sexual favors, to be touched, to be padded, to be victims of sexual abuse. No, today my sisters, my young sisters in particular, now today we roar, today we demand respect. And we know that um, sexual assault is often about power. And so today we flip the script and today we demonstrate our power by enacting into legislation and by discussing an issue that unfortunately for so often has um, gone unnoticed. Today we do it with 11 powerful women of the city council. 11 plus one, me. <laughs> Um, so we are at a, a moment, a crossroads, where real fundamental change seems possible. But change is not inevitable. We must not squander this moment. We must seize it. The Me Too moment has shown a light under a, lo uh, a lot of dark rocks, and many seem surprised by the vast scope of this epidemic. But I am not surprised. Women are not surprised. We all have a friend, a sister, a mother who was forced to put away their dreams because of a toxic culture of misogyny and systematic harassment. And yes, most of us have been victims. And we cannot know exactly how much promise was denied the world, but we know that it is far too much, that these, two, that these stories are far too common. We can talk about Fox News and we can talk about Harvey Weinstein all that we want, but we all have our own individual and personal, personal Harvey Weinsteins that we know. And so this legislation will allow us to be more transparent in the city, more responsive, and provide better avenues for reporting so that filing a complaint should not be burdensome. It must be clear and independent. And we can and we must ensure that every agency in the city of New York properly trains its workers and its managers. And we can and we must report on the incidents that do happen and take a hard look at ourselves to determine how we can do better going forward. We recognize that this is, uh, we don't have all of the answers, but this is just the beginning. We can and we must ensure that everyone in, in and out of city government knows their rights and the resources available to them. And we can and we must use our power to legislate our power to, of the purse, our tax paying dollars, to ensure that private businesses within our city that do business with us do the right thing. And we can and we must push companies to disclose mandatory arbitration policies that keep harassment in the shadows and out of the courts, which is the firmest pillar of government. And we can and we must create more transparency and oversight over non-disclosure agreements, which are often used to cover up sexual harassment or sexual discrimination. We can and we must mandate the training that too many companies currently ignore. And we can and we must extend the protection of the human rights law to every New York, no matter where they work. And we can and we must find the funding from the city or do, uh, from the city or do business with the city disclosure, which is mandatory, and we must have a comprehensive policy in place. But most importantly, we must, let, we must let women know that they are not alone and that we stand with them. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, it's basically up to the women. And so for the 11 powerful women who I call my sisters and my friends, I urge them to move the bill and to turn a hashtag into a law. I thank the chair, I thank all of you, and I thank all of the advocates and all of the young women who are here today. This is what leadership looks like. I think that's a new one, turn a hashtag into a law. It's beautiful. Um, I wanna welcome Majority Leader uh, Lori Cumbo and ask if she would like to say a few words about her legislation. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, and thank you for all that are here today, especially those that were on the steps of City Hall today, saying it loud and proud. 
About one in five Americans have experienced sexual harassment at work. About half of American women are sexually harassed at least once after joining the workforce. One in three women ages 18 to 34 have been sexually harassed at work. 71% of those women said they did not report it. Gender harassment is the most prevalent form of sexual harassment. Perhaps 15 to 20% of American women experience it annually. Imagine that in our workplaces, so many women, often young, often undocumented, many immigrant women of color, often are facing harassment that generally goes unreported. 71% of women in the workplace have said that they have not reported it. And today is so important because we are saying you can no longer say you didn't know. You can no longer say we've always done it this way. You can no longer say I just didn't understand. We are putting it out through this package of legislation that now you will have to know that this type of behavior will not be tolerated in the workplace. And as our former, well, excuse me, as our current president, hopefully it'll be former soon, <laughs> has said you can do whatever you want. This is a pushback. You can't do whatever you want. You can't do whatever you want and think that everyone likes it. No one likes it. This is a package of bills that's going to make sure that women and men, particularly those that are immigrant women and men, have an opportunity to work in a safe and comfortable environment and to know that they are there for their minds, their work ethic, their creative, and their talent abilities, and not for their bodies. I'm very proud of the bill that I'm supporting and introducing with speaker, excuse me, I'm also doing uh, another one, a public advocate, Letitia James, mandating that private employers conduct anti-sexual harassment training for their employees. The City of New York recognizes the importance of requiring anti-sexual harassment training as part of a holistic approach to combating workplace sexual harassment. I'm also working with Councilmember Robert Cornegie in requiring employers to post written policies and procedures to prevent sexual harassment. While anti-sexual harassment training is vitally important, so too is a daily reminder to employees and supervisors, managerial personnel of what their rights and responsibilities are. A simple and understandable poster outlining those rights and responsibilities will ensure that employees know what they can do to address sexual harassment in the workplace. And this is going to be so incredible for so many moving forward. I thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for conducting this very important hearing. And as public advocate Letitia James said, we are taking a hashtag and turning it into legislation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd now like to turn it over to the administration. Would thank you all you. please raise your right hand? I just need to swear you are. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Eugene, Public Advocate James, and members of the City Council Committee on Women and the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I am Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the Executive Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, also known as DCAS. I'm joined today by members of my Citywide Diversity and Equal Employment Opportunity Team, more commonly known as Citywide Diversity and EEO, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify today with Carmelyn P. Malalis, Chair and Commissioner of the City Commission on Human Rights, to inform you about the work the city is doing to prevent sexual harassment. One of the cornerstones of our municipal workforce, comprised of hardworking women and men, is a system based on merit, fitness, fairness, and equity. In a city as large and as diverse as ours, it is important to recognize that all employees- uh, Deputy Commissioner, I am so, uh, uh, so appreciate your patience. I'm really embarrassed to have to do this. But I'm gonna ask that we interrupt for one minute. Um, we had hoped that former controller Liz Holtzman, uh, who's running out of town, mm -hmm. would have a minute just to give some quick testimony I thought she had left. Turns out she's here. May I ask your of patience? Course. It'll be short and sweet, but it's so poignant. Of course. Um, it'll help us all understand why we're here today with absolute gratitude to the work you're doing. <clears throat> Thank you.
corrected. Can I submit it later, or do you Again, thank you, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, Controller Holtzman. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Eugene and members of the committee, public advocate. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank you for your graciousness and courtesy to me and accommodating my schedule. And I want to thank also the witnesses who were kind enough and gracious enough to uh, allow me to go first. Normally I wouldn't do this, but I have to catch a train. <laughs> so I, I just... Um, I'll try to be very brief and summarize my remarks, which I'll submit uh, to the council. I want to thank you, Chair Rosenthal, and you, Chair Eugene, for the vision that you've had in holding this hearing, and thank also the council speaker for supporting this effort. I want to congratulate you on your leadership in tackling an issue that is vital to the employees of New York City government and vital to the employees of all of all um, entities in New York City. It's vital for all New Yorkers and to the whole country. You are at the forefront of showing the way to change we sorely need, and the solutions you fashion to the widespread and terrible problem of sexual harassment can become a tool for making the lives of city government employees better, as well as becoming a model for the entire nation. The, me, the hashtag MeToo movement opened the eyes of America to the continued horrific problems of sexual harassment on the job. Too many women and even some men have been victimized. It even happened to me when I was a young summer law intern. At an out-of-town conference we were attending, the head of the organization I was working for asked me to come to his hotel room to discuss a legal issue. And when I entered, he physically threw me on the bed. Luckily, before he landed next to me, I was able to scramble off the bed and run out of the room. I didn't need the job for my future career. That was a fortunate thing. But too many of us don't have that choice. New York City government needs to be an example for the country in terms of how it deals with sexual harassment of its employees. We often tout our progressive leadership, but we ne need to be able to show that the reality of our city practices matches the values we espouse. 24 years ago, when I was New York City controller, I undertook to investigate how the city was handling the problem of sexual harassment in its workforce. I was prompted to do this by a complaint from a victim about sexual harassment in the fire department. Sexual harassment was not high on the city's agenda at the time, and so when my office sent out inquiries to every city agency seeking information on agency policies, and how the agency handled victims' complaints, we hit a brick wall. Agencies flatly resisted. They refused to cooperate. The Corporation Council objected as well. Finally, luckily, one agency responded, the Department of Transportation. My office analyzed the information we received from DOT, including how the complaints were handled, and discovered to our dismay that the agency was re-victimizing the victims when they came forward to complain and was failing to take action against the perpetrators. Instead of protecting its workforce, DOT just allowed sexual harassment to persist and fester. On top of that, the, city, the agency's failure to respond in a proper way to sexual harassment um, opened the city up to major liability. My office issued a report on what we found. The report is entitled Sexual Harassment at the New York City Department of Transportation, a case study. It was issued in 1993. I provided a copy of the report to Chair Rosenthal, and I respectfully request that it be inserted in the record so that it can be made public uh, for others to examine. I'll be happy to give you a copy. Uh, it's worth looking at. I could just, I know you said I was going to be a minute, but I just was rereading it as I was waiting. And um, you'll see, for example, uh, there was no punishment of any serious nature. People made complaints, and you can imagine how difficult it was to make the complaint to begin with because you don't know what's going to happen. And the complaint is substantiated, and all that happens is there's a reprimand and something entered into the file. And by the way, it's noted in one of these cases that no record of this shall, complaint shall be kept outside of the information contained in the EEO's file. So it's, it was a way just to protect and preserve a system of ongoing harassment. 
that has to end. And that's what I think is the wonderful thing about today. And actually, it's the great thing about this country, is that we can learn from the mistakes we made and change that and not make these mistakes again. I want to say that it's critical, given our report and the absence of follow-up, that New York City government is doing the right thing. We have to make sure the city's anti-harassment policies are effective, comprehensive, and fair. We need to make sure that they incorporate the best practices in use around the country, even the world. We need to seek out leading academic thinking and research on the subject and talk to advocacy groups working with victims. In short, we need to ensure that the city's policies for its workforce are the finest anywhere, providing protection for victims and holding perpetrators accountable. And with the leadership of the city council and, and these two committees and the support of the mayor, I know this can happen. But excellent policies are not enough. The city council or another independent entity, such as the controller's office or the Department of Investigation, should examine the actual practices of city agencies. What is really happening? Are victims still being victimized? Are protected, perpetrators still being protected? Is it the same old, same old? Or have things really changed and changed enough? Finding out the reality is going to be a tall order. In addition, the city needs to extend its anti-harassment policies to businesses with which it does business and to companies in which the city's pension funds invest. Its procurement and investment clout need to be put to work on this issue as well. Now that you have made such an important start on this mission, you cannot and should not stop until it is clear that justice is truly being done. And I pledge to be of whatever assistance I can in this endeavor. Thank you very much. And thank you again to members of the administration. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for staying. And I know how tight it is to get to your train, so I'm going to let you go. Thank That's you right. very much. My colleagues. Um, I saw Council Member Reynoso uh, was here for a moment, and I'd like to ask the administration to come back and actually start from the beginning, if that's all right with you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal. Chair Eugene, Public Advocate James, and members of the City Council Committee on Women and the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I'm Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the Executive Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, also known as DCAS. I'm joined today by members of my Citywide Diversity and EEO team, more commonly known as CDEEO. I am pleased to have the opportunity to testify today with Carmelyn P. Malalis, Chair and Commissioner of the City Commission on Human Rights, to inform you about the work the city is doing to prevent sexual harassment. One of the cornerstones of our municipal workforce, comprised of hardworking women and men, is a system based on merit, fitness, fairness, and equity. In a city as large and as diverse as ours, it is important to recognize that all employees should be afforded the opportunity to work in a safe environment that is free from discrimination and harassment. Of particular concern is the issue of sexual harassment and the dark cloud it casts on the protections that our employees so richly deserve. I'm here today to provide some information on how DCAS and its Office of Citywide Diversity and EEO partner with city agencies to ensure that EEO claims in general and sexual harassment claims in particular are addressed in a professional, thoughtful, and transparent manner. Citywide Diversity and EEO's primary mission is to enable city agencies to comply with the citywide EEO policy and the city charter provisions and laws governing equal employment opportunity. To this end, we assist and collaborate with city agencies in developing measures and initiatives to effectively fulfill their EEO obligations and their commitment to diversity and inclusion. Pursuant to Chapter 35, Section 814 of the Charter, DCAS is responsible for establishing uniform procedures and standards to assist city agencies to effectively implement their mandated responsibilities with respect to EEO and equity. The city's EEO policy established pursuant to this authority recognizes all the protections as provided by city, state, and federal law, including the prohibition on sexual harassment. The implementation of the city's EEO policy and its related procedures are mandatory for city agencies, and the citywide diversity and EEO team monitor citywide compliance. 
DCAS establishes procedures to drive uniformity and consistency across city agencies in implementing the city's EEO policy. These procedures include, but are not limited to, the EEO complaint procedural guidelines, reasonable accommodation procedural guidelines, and the workplace gender transition guidelines. DCAS has established standardized training and reporting requirements to further drive agencies' compliance under the EEO policy and to ensure that all persons receive the same information with respect to EEO and equity in the workplace. DCAS also develops and delivers standardized EEO, diversity, and inclusion training. These courses are consistent with best practices and guidance provided by civil rights, rights enforcement agencies like the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, New York State Division of Human Rights, and the New York City Commission on Human Rights. EEO, diversity, and inclusion trainings are offered year-round and are accessible to all city employees. Section 815 of the Charter requires agency heads to adopt measures and programs to ensure equal employment opportunity in accordance with the uniform procedures and standards established by DCAS. The city's EEO policy further requires agencies to conduct a thorough review of all EEO complaints, which include complaints of sexual harassment and requests for reasonable accommodations, and to report these complaints to DCAS on a quarterly basis. The EEO complaint Procedural guidelines instruct agency EEO officers, investigators, and counselors in their investigation of EEO complaints in a fair, consistent, and timely manner. In addition to providing step-by-step -step instructions for each phase of the complaint intake and investigative processes, the guidelines include sample questions for investigations, templates for letters, and specifies the timeframes within which complaints can be submitted and when invest investigations should be completed. DCAS also undertakes third-party investigations when agencies have a conflict of interest in investigating the complaint themselves. It shares that function with the city's law department in an effort to ensure that every internal complaint will be fully and fairly investigated. The city charter requires each agency head to adopt and implement an annual diversity and EEO plan that the agency will undertake to ensure fair and effective measures to provide equal employment opportunity. The citywide EEO plan requires the agencies to submit to DCAS quarterly reports on their efforts to implement the diversity and EEO plan. It also requires the agencies to submit complaint data and data concerning reasonable accommodation requests for the quarter to DCAS. The citywide diversity, excuse me, the citywide EEO plan requires agencies to submit these reports to the mayor's office, DCAS, the city council, and the Equal Employment Practices Commission, EEPC. Citywide diversity and EEO uses these reports to inform policy statements, training, and to provide ongoing guidance to agencies. In addition to our charter authority, DCAS's commitment to fostering an informed, equitable, and inclusive workplace is further demonstrated in its ongoing provision of consultation, interpretive guidance of policy, and training that goes beyond what the charter requires. On a monthly basis, the Citywide Diversity and EEO team hosts best practices meetings with the EEO officers from across the city to discuss relevant topics, including but not limited to proposed legislation, complaint trends, upcoming training, qu quarterly plan submissions, EEO and diversity and inclusion trends and benchmarking. The team also utilizes engagement surveys to assess training content, training needs, and to identify other opportunities for citywide information sharing. The city's EEO community also has 24-hour access, 24 access to standardized procedures, templates, and other relevant resources via DCAS's EEO and diversity website. Additionally, CDY Diversity and EEO's training portfolio has continued to expand with its creation of courses covering unconscious bias, structured interviewing, disability etiquette, and LGBTQ awareness and inclusion. With regard to sexual harassment, DCAS is taking a holistic approach to equip agencies with the resources needed to prevent sexual harassment and other inappropriate workplace behaviors and to deal with and report incidents when they arise. Since fiscal year 2009, DCAS has offered EEO, e-learning, and instructor-led training, which covers sexual harassment and complaint filing. This training is part of our ongoing offering of courses and is available to all city employees with access to a computer or via enrollment in a classroom course. 
The city's EEO practitioners are further required to take a five-day intensive diversity and EEO training program as part of their onboarding process or as a refresher course based on material developments in the law or the city's EEO requirements. Additionally, over the last year, DCAS has worked to develop a specific e-learning module on sexual harassment prevention entitled Sexual Harassment Prevention, What to Know About Unlawful and Inappropriate Behaviors in the Workplace. The creation of a citywide module on sexual harassment is a first for the city and serves as another example of the city's commitment to its workforce and the ongoing work being done to improve workplace culture. The module was first piloted with EEO professionals and attorneys across the city in January. Feedback from these pilot sessions had been incorporated and it is my pleasure to announce that the module is complete and ready for launch. This interactive training will be rolled out to agencies in phases starting with DCAS. Additionally, as a second phase of this project, DCAS will develop instructor-led training for individuals without direct access to computers and will explore the creation of bystander training as well as targeted training for managers and supervisors. To supplement resources currently provided to city agencies looking to release communications regarding sexual harassment, Citywide Diversity and EEO has also prepared a template for a sexual harassment policy statement for agency heads. Agencies will be able to adopt the language or customize the statement to incorporate agency-specific information prior to disseminating the statement to their employees on an annual basis. I'm pleased to share that the template is also ready for distribution. Once issued, the policy statement will be posted on the DCAS EEO and Diversity website to complement the release of the e-learning module. Consistent with public and private practices, citywide diversity and EEO has taken a holistic approach to fostering a citywide workplace culture in which employment and advancement decisions are made fairly, employees are treated equitably, the inclusion of diverse experiences are embraced, and that harassment of any kind is not tolerated. Our provision of standardized resources, consultation, and an expanded training portfolio to EEO professionals and all public servants positions the city to identify and effectively address inappropriate workplace communications and behaviors. Although sexual harassment is the topic of today's hearing, it is incumbent upon all of us as members of the municipal workforce to confront harassment in all of its forms as individuals and as a community. Our individual and collective efforts will create a safe space within every city agency to ensure that direct and indirect inquiries and complaints of harassment are handled appropriately and expeditiously. In the coming months, my colleagues in citywide diversity and EEO and I will continue to engage city agencies to review our existing EEO policies and procedures and to strengthen them where necessary. We also look forward to discussing with the committees the recent bills introduced in the City Council on this topic and to helping to further refine them as necessary to fill any gaps in the already strong laws and policies the city has implemented to address all forms of employment discrimination. I thank you for the opportunity to highlight the work performed by the DCAS team with respect to sexual harassment, EEO, equity, and inclusion. We look forward to the Council's continued partnership and will gladly answer any questions. I want to welcome Councilmember Lander. Great. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Eugene, and members of the Committees on Women and Civil and Human Rights. Uh, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here today with my colleagues from DCAS. And I want to introduce one of my colleagues from the Commission on Human Rights, uh, my Deputy Commissioner for Policy and IGA, Dana Sussman, who is here with me as well today. Uh, I'm Carmelyn P. Malalas, and I'm the Chair and Commissioner for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. For those in the room that do not know, the Commission is the city agency mandated by statute to enforce New York City's robust protections against discrimination and harassment, including sexual harassment. Uh, I want to thank you for convening today's hearing on this very critical topic. The Commission has been a leader in the fight against sexual harassment for decades, and today we proudly continue that work by aggressively enforcing the city human rights law in this area, which is more protective and more robust than protections at the state and federal level. In the 1970s, one of my predecessors, now Congressperson Eleanor Holmes Norton, 
held the country's first ever public hearings on gender discrimination when she chaired this agency. And in fact, the first reported usage of the term sexual harassment was at a Commission on Human Rights hearing in 1977. While sexual harassment in the workplace is not a new phenomenon, we are nationally experiencing a reckoning with regards to this all too common human rights abuse. And deep thanks are owed to the women, men, and non-binary people who have been bravely coming forward at much personal and professional expense to share their stories of sexual harassment and assault across different industries. The wave of people breaking their silence has been steady and it has been unrelenting. And it is our hope that this collective work allows even more voices to be heard and even more stories to be surfaced. The power structures that have existed for so long to allow this behavior to persist for in some cases decades, to silence victims, to shame victims, to make victims believe that they are powerless, they are crumbling upon us. And sexual harassment is being exposed for what it is, an abuse of power and privilege. And it is being exposed in many of these instances with women leading the way. Though abuses in the entertainment industry continue to dominate the headlines, we know that low-wage workers, immigrant workers, domestic workers, LGBTQ workers, and workers of color experience sexual harassment at extremely high rates. And their unique and intersecting vulnerabilities make it even harder for them to assert their rights, protect themselves, and demand justice. And many of these kinds of workers, they file claims at the Commission on Human Rights. And though their stories of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation are known to the Commission staff, the people that investigate and prosecute their claims, as well as the people who work to strengthen and educate their community's employers, we also knew that their stories were not being given adequate public airing. And so with this recognition, the Commission organized and held a citywide public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace on December 6, 2017 about three months after the renewed interest in hashtag MeToo. We heard testimony from a diversity of industries, from construction to domestic workers, to the modeling and fashion industry. And we heard from workers and advocates and government officials about what New York City and the commission could do differently or do better to combat sexual harassment. It was a powerful night where over 100 people converged from across the boroughs, and some people even came in from Washington, D.C., to listen to people's experiences enduring, fighting, challenging, and overcoming sexual harassment. We extended invitations to the general public, community-based organizations, legal advocates, all of the city council members, other local and some state elected officials, and the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, among others. And right now I want to take a moment to publicly thank all the people, some of whom are here today, who submitted testimony or testified in person or stayed throughout that long night to listen to the testimony, including public advocate Letitia James, state assembly member Carmen de la Rosa, and the EEOC. The Commission will be releasing a report this spring that will include our findings and recommendations, including policy recommendations, best practices for specific types of workplaces, and other essential information from the hearing. We will make sure that members of the two committees here in this body receive copies of that report, and we will be happy to review it with you. Starting in early 2016, in response to the activism surrounding the Women's March, the Commission has worked with local and national media to contribute to stories on gender discrimination and the unique protections under the city human rights law. And this work has garnered close to 100 press mentions on gender discrimination and sexual harassment so far. Last year, the Commission published a first ever public outreach brochure on city human rights law protections regarding issues that disproportionately affect women including information on pregnancy, caregiver, and gender discrimination, along with a fact sheet on sexual and street harassment, both of which are available on our website in 10 languages. These materials were promoted in a digital and social media ad campaign in March of last year, during Women's History Month, obtaining over 2 million views, and have been distributed at many commission community events and to community-based organizations across the five boroughs. 
Over the past few months, the Commission's web content on gender discrimination and sexual harassment, including video content from our historic December hearing, has garnered close to 300,000 views online. And this coming April, we will also be launching a citywide public awareness campaign on workplace sexual harassment, protections under city human rights law, and how to access the commission as a resource with ads in subway cars, bus shelters, and across community, ethnic, digital, and social media, and of course, in multiple languages. As with our other campaigns of the last three years, we will work with employee rights advocates, uh, advocates for employers and in the management bar, chambers of commerce and business associations, community-based organizations, legal services, faith-based organizations, and other groups to make sure that we get the word out. The Commission has also revamped its sexual harassment in the workplace training, which we provide free of charge to community-based organizations, nonprofits, business associations, and other entities consistent with our capacity. We have received significant interest from different organizations and groups to provide this training, and we have been rolling it out this month. Now, in the past few months, the Commission has received quite a bit of attention for its work combating sexual harassment and strong legal protections that exist within the city. Um, so you will see that in my written testimony, I have included some of the issue that is specific to the city human rights law that for purposes of brevity at the hearing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over. But there's growing recognition that the federal standard, severe or pervasive, is insufficient and outdated. And that broader standards like that that we have here under the New York City Human Rights Law could be a model elsewhere. And in fact, lawmakers from other jurisdictions, including the California State Senate and the US Senate, have sought our feedback and expertise in exploring alternative standards and crafting sexual harassment legislation. I want to highlight a few other important aspects of our law that I think are also relevant to some of the bills in the package and to some of the questions that folks have been asking. Independent contractors, interns, volunteers, whether paid or unpaid, are also protected under the city human rights law. Specifically, independent contractors who may not have workplace rights under state or federal statutes are protected as employees under the city human rights law so long as they are not employers themselves. We understand that there is proposed legislation to further clarify uh, and expand protections for independent contractors, and the Commission is interested in working with the Council to move this legislation forward. In addition, workers who have signed arbitration agreements may still bring claims to the Commission. The Commission has authority to bring claims against covered entities without an individual being named. And acting as the complainant, the Law Enforcement Bureau of the Commission can require that the respondent pay damages to the wronged party, regardless of whether that individual signed an arbitration agreement. In addition to mandating policy changes, training, and the payment of civil penalties to the general fund of the City of New York, we should all be proud of the robust protections of the city human rights law then that it provides to New Yorkers employed in both the public and the private sectors. And I'm grateful to the people, many of whom are in this room up there and out here in the audience, who have worked very hard to strengthen these protections. There are, however, certainly areas where we can expand protections and improve access to information and training and tools to ensure that employers more readily comply with the law. We are proud to be working closely with the City Council on the package of bills that have just been introduced, and we also look forward to continuing that work together on our shared goals of strengthening the city human rights law and expanding resources to New Yorkers. Over the past three years, under my leadership at the Commission, we have been particularly aggressive on sexual harassment cases. Gender-based discrimination is consistently one of the most common forms of employment discrimination the Commission investigates. And in 2017, claims of gender-based discrimination were the top discrimination area of complaint in employment, with 117 claims, or 17% of all employment-related claims. In the last two years, sexual harassment claims at the Commission increased by 43% over the previous two years. And since 2015, the Commission has secured over $1.4 million in penalties and damages for sexual harassment cases. 
In my first year, my office issued a final decision and order in a case of egregious sexual harassment involving multiple instances of unwanted touching and constant lewd comments about the complainant's body and sexual availability over a three-year period. The respondent admitted to the behavior and even claiming that he was entitled to it. And the commission levied the highest penalty ever in commission history, $250,000 in addition to over $400,000 in damages to the complainant. Three recent settlements also illustrate both the work of the commission enforcing the law in this area and also the importance of the more generous city human rights law standard. The commission awarded an employee of a construction company nearly $60,000 in emotional distress damages and back pay after her supervisor sent her a lewd text message and subjected her to unwanted advances. When she was asked and when she was asked that her supervisor keep things professional, he fired her. In another recent case, an employee alleged that a supervisor made unwanted comments of a sexual nature towards her and grabbed her crotch, uh, while leering, or grabbed his crotch while leering at her and while they were alone in the office. Again, the commission found probable cause that sexual harassment had occurred and settled the case for $50,000 in damages for emotional distress to the complainant. And in a case involving a worker at a national fast food chain, the commission found probable cause where the worker's manager rubbed her shoulders and spoke to her in sexually explicit terms. The commission found that the touching and the comments were sufficient to demonstrate sexual harassment under the New York City human rights law and settled the case for $10,000 in damages for emotional distress to the complainant. From our historic public hearing this past December and our upcoming report on sexual harassment, to our increased enforcement and heightened damages and penalties, to our updated sexual harassment training and extensive communications campaigns, I hope it is clear that the Commission takes our mandate to enforce the broad protections of the city human rights law extremely seriously. We will continue to act aggressively on sexual harassment to ensure that New Yorkers feel safe and respected and supported in the workplace. I truly appreciate this opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to welcome Councilmember. Oh, Councilman Rodriguez was here for a nanosecond. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, I I do just want to mention very quickly that Councilmember Lander has a bill that uh, would that we should be talking about as well, and we'll come up in a future hearing that protects uh, freelancers. You had mentioned it, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing your comments about his legislation as well. Um, Councilmember Eugene, do you want to start with questions, or would you like me uh, to jump in? You can, start, but I, I, just, I just want to ask uh, one or two questions, and I turn it over to you. Uh, we know that uh, harassment is a very tough situation, very, very tough situation. And that, uh, you know, uh, the impact on the victim is not only temporary, is not only at the time of the uh, aggression, but they are going to be traumatized for all their life. And some of the time they are in situation, they are afraid to raise their voices and to make complaint because of you know fear of retaliation, they don't want to lose their job. So what is uh, what is the, the 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 process or what the Human Commission right has in place to protect those people and to ensure they can be comfortable to make complaint and we can make the necessary changes that we are looking for in the workplace. Sure, so thank you for that question, Chair Eugene. Um, you know, it provides me an opportunity to make sure that everyone here knows that uh, the Commission's website has very specific instructions on how folks can contact our agency. We, of course, receive complaints from the public, either from individuals who are victims of discrimination or harassment themselves, from other elected officials, from uh, community-based organiza organizations or faith-based groups, or you know, kind of the gamut of different entities that are here in New York City that provide us information from which the Law Enforcement Bureau at the Commission on Human Rights is able to investigate these claims. And one of the most powerful provisions, I think, that we have 
uh, under our statute is our ability to initiate those investigations even without having a complainant's name on that complaint. It allows us as the Commission on Human Rights to initiate investigations on behalf of the Commission, which is really on behalf of the city, so that people who might be you know, vulnerable to other forms of retaliation or discrimination, people who do not want to have their names on a formal complaint, we can still investigate their situation without themselves putting the, 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 their name or themselves out there and making themselves more vulnerable. It's a very important provision of the law and it's something that I always try to mention in public settings so folks know that even if they are scared about identifying themselves, that there are other ways that our agency is able to assist them. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the website because this is the era of technology. Right now, you know, there is nothing we can do without computers, without, without our technology. But we have to admit also, New York City is home to so many people coming from all over the place, especially immigrant people. People who are not literate in uh, computers. People who don't even speak English properly. And people who are working hard, hardworking people, who are trying to strive and to, 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 to provide for their families and to pay the roof over their head and bring the food on the table. Many of them don't have time to, do, to, to go to the computer. And many of them, they don't know really how to use properly a computer. What do you have available to reach out to them to ensure that them also, they are protected? when they are fair, when they don't want to raise their voices, where they go to get the information to know what to do to raise their complaint and to formulate their complaints and to make sure also them also, they are protected. Right. Absolutely, uh, you raise a great point, Chair Eugene. And you know, that is, the, people oftentimes think of the, uh, the agency and think only about the law enforcement bureau or the law enforcement abilities of the agency. We are, uh, you know, our, our law is structured in such a way that also allows us to have a community relations bureau, and that's a mandate of the agency as well. And with that, that means that we have uh, community service centers in each one of the five boroughs. Their mandate is to be working within communities, meeting people where they are, commuting, uh, communicating with people uh, the way that best expresses the, uh, the ideas to those specific communities. Um, so that they know what their rights are under the law and what they know um, what their resources are at the agency. Since I've been here as commissioner of this agency, we have made language access a priority. Uh, my staff now speak 36 languages across my agency. When people contact us uh, with language that, one of, uh, that does not fall within one of those 36 languages, we of course avail of language support services so that we are able to communicate with people. Uh, I will also tell you that 100% of our media ad buys are in ethnic and community media. We are well aware that social media and that website uh, information is not the sole way that people in New York City receive their information. And so we do want to make sure that people are receiving our information and information about our resources uh, in multiple ways. And thank you very much. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, immigrants, but we know that they are facing several challenges. And among the challenges, we can mention the culture. Because you know, people coming from other countries, many of them, they don't even have a clue about sexual harassment. They may be harassed, but they don't even know that. As we know that it could be the culture, or the way, the modus of event in their countries. So I think that uh, we have to not only use uh, languages, different languages, but educate them. And the way to educate them in the staff, among the staff, we have to include also people who speak their languages and people who know their culture. What the Human Rights Commission has been doing to ensure that people, to, that you know, the staff is diverse. Mm -hmm include people of different ethnic backgrounds. Of course, we cannot include everybody, impossible. But to include as many people as we can and other that we can do a better job in serving not only New Yorkers, but all of the people, immigrants, regardless of where they come from. What you, know, you have been doing, or the Human Rights Commission has been doing 
to ensure that we address the issues and everybody can understand, can have the information that they need to be protected. Right. Uh, I will tell you that coming from an immigrant family myself, reaching out to the city's different immigrant communities is very important to me. I think I mentioned the three six languages. That's somewhat indicative of the diversity of the staff at the Commission on Human Rights. We are a small agency, but we are an agency filled with people who are strong believers in human rights and in the work that our agency does. Thanks to the administration and thanks to the city council, uh, we've expanded quite a bit in the last three years. We've gone from a staff of 55 to now a staff of 156. And in that three-year three period, I'd say the majority of the people who have come to the commission are people who have personal lived experience working in many of the vulnerable communities uh, that call the commission, that file claims here, that reach out to our community service center staff. Um, uh, I think diversity is incredibly important, as is, of course, inclusion, which is also why we do mandatory, we internally do mandatory uh, cultural competency trainings for all commission staff. Uh, so I 100% agree with you. We, I don't know that anyone deserves, you know, a 100% scorecard in diversity, uh, but you can be sure that it's something that we are always thinking about at my agency and striving to do better at. When your agency receives a complaint, guide us, explain us, what is the next step you know, toward the investigation? How do you determine which complaint you're going to investigate and, or not? What, what are the different steps you go through to investigate the complaint? And when you get the result, what are the actions that have been taken? Sure. So the types of claims that come into our agency are, by their very nature, very fact-specific. Uh, so if somebody is calling the agency and is, uh, you know, either asking questions about whether or not we have jurisdiction over their situation or is calling to report a claim of discrimination or harassment, they will speak to one of our law enforcement bureau uh, staff. They will schedule an appointment to actually speak in person. Uh, with an attorney from our law enforcement bureau, um, and they will go over the, the, the facts and the circumstances that are underlying their complaint. Uh, the law enforcement bureau, in, in the beginning of this type of process, has something of a, uh, a neutral posture in that they are just fact gathering. They are receiving information from the complainant. They are, they are uh, gathering information or, or evidence, perhaps from other witnesses. They are reaching out to the bad actor or bad actors or potential bad actors in those situations, the entities that are being accused of discrimination and harassment and conducting these types of interviews. Um, and then at some point in this process, the Law Enforcement Bureau doesn't have to make a decision as to whether or not they think that there is probable cause under the city human rights law to believe that the discriminatory act occurred. And it is again based on these types of interviews and evidence being presented. Uh, after that uh, determination is made, if there in fact is a determination that there is probable cause to, 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 uh, uh, to see that the uh, discriminatory act occurred, that case then can be um, referred to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings for a full trial on the matter. Uh, an administrative law judge con con uh, you know, convenes the parties for a full trial, um, after which the administrative law judge would then uh, uh, provide a report and recommendation on both liability and damages. That report would come back to the Commission on Human Rights, and then the Commission on Human Rights would issue a final decision and order on both liability and damages. Uh, I'm going to ask the last question because I know many other colleagues uh, need to ask questions also, but can, what can you tell us about the number of complaints reported to your agencies? And how many, you know, from the city work places and how many from non-city workplaces? Mm -hmm. All types of claims or are we just looking at sexual harassment, just for clarification? Sexual harassment. Sure. Uh, if you give me a moment. So we are currently investigating 148 cases of sexual harassment. Uh, if you look at all the claims of sexual harassment that are currently under investigation right now at the Commission on Human Rights, of those 148 
cases, 16 of those cases involve city agencies. And of those 16 cases, there are 10 cases, or I'm sorry, there are 10 city agencies that are implicated in those 16 cases. Thank you very much. I will follow up uh, uh, later on. Thank you very much. I please, uh, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. I'm going to ask Chair Cumbo, um, sorry, <laughs> Councilmember Cumbo, Majority Leader Cumbo, to next, ask the next round of questions. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Just have two basic questions. As far as the legislation that I've introduced with Public Advocate James, um, intro 1463, mandating that private employers conduct anti-sexual harassment training for their employees, other than the amount of hours that are required um, in order to qualify for that type of training, other than that, do you have other issues as it pertains to this legislation? You know, I think, um, first of all, thank you for the, thank you for the, uh, that piece of legislation. And in fact, it is something that had come up uh, during the December hearing that we had. Um, people, what, what, that, what that bill covers is something that had come up, I think, from a variety of different people who testified at our December hearing. So it was nice to, um, to get validation for, for that need here. Um, you know, I think as with all the, the types of legislation that come before us, we are always very eager to be working with the city council on different ways that we could be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, tweaking bills to make sure that they are, uh, you know, responsive to whatever the actual need is. Mm -hmm. um, and I said earlier that we're releasing our uh, report from our December hearing coming up in April. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing that is because we want to kind of take in all the information that we received, not, not only in person at the hearing, but we also allowed a period where people were able to submit written testimony afterwards. So we've been reviewing all of that testimony so that we could come up with what we think would be the best practices and the best ways of addressing some of the needs. Uh, and I suspect that some of the, the, the things and recommendations that we will be coming up with would be consistent with some things that are in the package. So I think it's just looking through at the details. I see. That sounds promising. When do you think that you will have a thorough assessment of the information that you're reviewing um, currently? You mean from our hearing? Mm -hmm. So we are set to release our report in April. And in April, you'll have a better understanding of how this legislation fits with the feedback that you've gotten um, over that period of time. That is my expectation. Okay, and also is the, for intro 1462 with Council Member Cornegie and myself requiring employers to post written policies and procedures to prevent sexual harassment. What are your thoughts on that piece? Again, you'll, you'll be happy to hear that that was again a consistent uh, thread that we heard at the hearing. I think you'll also be happy to hear that right now, um, you know, when the commission conciliates or settles matters with respondents, we are already requiring this and I'm trying to think of, I'm challenged to think of a case where we haven't required this. Um, so we, we uh, yeah, you know, strongly support this piece of legislation and again, would be working with you to make sure that we have what we need to, to get at um, the issue we're trying to address. Happy to hear it and I look forward to the feedback and how we can strengthen this legislation um, so that it fits the needs of the advocates and the folks that are unfortunately living with this dynamic um, every day in our work environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Sure. Uh, Councilmember Lander. Uh, thank you to both chairs and, and thank you, Chair Rosenthal, in particular, for your leadership on this topic and helping push the city and the council forward. Um, and thanks so much to our, uh, our city partners and especially to the Human Rights Commission. Um, you know, you think about, we're now at the, this is the first hearing of these committees in this term. Yep. You think about where we were in the first committee, the first hearings we had a term ago. Uh, we didn't yet have your leadership. The commission had really been decimated. Um, and you're rebuilding it internally in partnership with the council, our collective ability to triple basically the funding so that you could grow the staff um, and pursue all the things that you're talking about is really um, significant. So we have a long way to go. I think strength, you know, the, everything we can do to root out harassment is necessary and we're called to do it. So I appreciate uh, the work we're doing together, but I, I do think it's worth noting we, we've come a long way from where we were and I'm, I'm grateful for your leadership in partnership with the council in, in doing it. Um, 
Uh, I appreciate you were mentioning the, the language to clarify and strengthen the protections that freelancers and independent contractors uh, have under the law. I look forward to I thank the, the chair for her reference to that, and hopefully we can work on, on moving that forward uh, here as well. One particular category of, of contracted or independent workers that we've heard a lot from, and there was that article in the Times about the work Assemblywoman Nili Razik is doing around models and folks in the modeling industry and particularly pervasive uh, harassment that takes place there. I know we've also talked a little about trying to do some other things like address the um, exclusive contract problem that, folk, that makes you know, yep. workers even more vulnerable there. Um, was that you know was, was that something that you heard at the hearing, and do you have thoughts on what we can do to further strengthen our, our work absolutely there? i'm I'm grateful that there were people uh, some of the people are here today in fact who uh, uh, you know are um, working with people from the models Alliance, folks from Fordham University uh, and people who I think have been working far beyond the time that um, has just you know, um, elucidated the problems that we have uh, in New York City and elsewhere that, that, and the challenges that face uh, folks in the modeling industry. So we had, uh, we had several people actually uh, testify during our December uh, uh, six hearing specific to that industry. Um, and certainly we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, parts of our report coming out in April that address that. I think one of the other reasons that the hearing was so helpful, it helps also to um, provide some perspective to folks at the commission on areas that we obviously can and, and should be doing more to put out there as our areas of jurisdiction. Um, you know, one of the things that came out at the hearing, there had been, I think, some uh, some confusion as to whether or not independent contractors or which I think is very specific to this uh, to this industry, whether they were covered uh, for purposes of being protected under our law. And one of the things that we're obviously you know, going to be making clear going forward is that, of course, yes, they are. They are uh, covered under the city human rights law unless they are uh, otherwise employers themselves. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with the council on you know, this area as with others. Um, and we have been working, like I said, with the advocates for folks in this industry to make sure that they have resources within the agency and they know how to utilize our law. Thank you. We'll look forward to hearing that testimony. And, and Madam Chair, maybe we should talk to Assemblywoman Razik about what she's looking at. And also, uh, you know, this, the, as well, we had heard that one, one particular problem is this requirement that folks work under exclusive contracts. Um, which they can't then get outside of, and, and there might be some room there. Um, my last uh, question, um, I think, just speaks to um, to what extent we're looking at strategies to uh, change culture as well as regulation and enforcement. Regulation enforcement is critical. That is the charge of the Human Rights Commission, and not to. But the, you know, we, we've got a moment right now when we have a responsibility to do everything we can in a much broader way, you know, in our schools, in, you know, and we've got a set of things we've long done, both on the administration and on the council side. We do intimate partner violence, the council funds a series of contracts to try to help do education. There's a set of things taking place in the schools, but I, I guess I just wonder, in addition to what's already a lot of work here, um, are you out of that hearing or, or elsewhere? To what extent is the administration trying to develop a, an even broader approach that says in how we think about what we're educating in our schools, in what we're doing through our, uh, you know, how do we, in addition to strengthening our laws and strengthening enforcement, take this moment to just change culture, how men and boys are, are brought up and live in this city in a way that makes us, um, you know, better, respectful, more equal citizens. Right. That's a big task, but right. it seems like a moment when we should be pushing ourselves to do everything we can. Absolutely. And that, you know, certainly the, um, the contents of our report coming out in April will not be confined solely to just like legal recommendations and best practices of that nature, but I think broadly speaking, other ways in which we as a city should be looking to, um, to make sure we're fostering dignity and respect in this situation and, and in other situations. Uh, you know, we, um, we, like I said earlier, we have the Community Relations Bureau, partly because, you know, we're also very much aware that the way that we have impact throughout the city is not just about enforcement. It's just, it's not only about legal enforcement, and it needs to be coupled with the types of discussions and workshops and 
um, uh, relationship building that takes place more on that community relations side, working with schools and working with different communities and organizations uh, to be thinking through how we can best communicate the challenges that women and girls um, you know, face in these situations and to be working, frankly, with employers and businesses so they have a better understanding of what their obligations are under the law, but also beyond the law, what are best practices in these situations? So even if the law does not require certain things, what can they do as caring employers, people who want to be doing the right thing at the right time? Uh, I think beyond the types of trainings on the law that, um, that you know, we are, we, we've, we've thought of and, you know, certainly the council has thought of in terms of uh, training people on what their obligations are or their rights are under the law. Um, this is also an area where I think bystander intervention has been very important. It's, um, it's great to see folks from Hollaback here. I know that they have been uh, a champion of that for a very long time. The commission had talked a lot about and engaged in bystander training related work, um, you know, in the past year and a half um, in that time, it was very specific to the types of uh, xenophobia or Islamophobia that we, or anti-Semitism that we had seen reported at the agency. And this is an area that I think is, of course, very ripe for us to also be thinking about bystander intervention and to be working with other entities to make sure that people are thinking outside of the box. Thank you. I guess I'll just end in that regard by saying I'm proud that this is my first hearing now as a member of the, the Women's Issues Committee. I was on the Civil and Human Rights Committee already, but I asked to be added to this one. And I think it obviously it is inspiring and critical that leadership is taken uh, by women in the city. And it's, it's, you know, having you in that chair and having Chair Rosenthal in that one is, is critical. And of course, it is also important that we find ways to step up and not just in that like as a father and a husband way, but in a like as a citizen of this city committed to equality and justice. Um, we're going to find ways to push yeah. um, the, the men of this city to take our responsibility in the workplace for this hearing, but more broadly as well. So if there are thoughts on ways we can continue in addition to these laws to be pushing and doing that better, we look forward, I look forward to working as a member of this committee and as a partner with you on that. Great. Great. Thank you. Oh, I actually wanted to add something just on the city side. So there's a great deal of training that we've specifically done around EEO regulations as well as sexual harassment. And when you talk about culture, um, Commissioner Malalas is exactly right. Having a space where there is an open dialogue is key. And so one of the things, and we've actually brought um, the slide deck um, for you to review our sexual harassment training that we're seeking to launch is really how we try to hone in on the responsibility and the accountability that managers and supervisors have. So not only are they mandatory reporters, they also contribute directly to the culture of an organization. So if you know that you have a manager and if you are afraid to come forward and file a complaint, but if you know you share that information with a trusted manager or supervisor, and then they in turn can then advocate on your behalf, I, we just think that those things are also very critical to having the kind of workplace culture we want in the city. So we've been actively working with our EEO officers to really talk about how we empower not only bystanders, managers, supervisors, HR counterparts, because sometimes they are the first face someone sees when they come into an organization, to also own the fact that you know harassment anywhere impacts all of us. Thank you. Thank you. You answered my first question, so oh. that was a really nice segue. I appreciate it. Did you mention you had a, a sheet with a something, well, something we, on it? We actually brought gifts for you guys, but we didn't know when it was the appropriate time to um, share it. Um, now it's the appropriate. We have <laughs> the um, the slide deck. Well, yes, it's actually oh, the great. screenshots of our sexual harassment training. Um, as mentioned in our testimony, it's complete. Uh, we did not want, it actually was complete on February 27th, coincidentally, um, but we wanted to make sure that we share that information um, with the council so that you would have um, a sneak peek before we launch citywide. Um, I think that you will find that the training prevention program that we put in place really aligns with some of your overarching goals with respect to mandatory training in sexual, uh, related to sexual harassment. Okay, and this was just... Uh, finished yesterday. It's fresh off the presses, yes. Okay. We actually started this project so this, a year ago. This, this hearing has already produced the results we hoped for. Um, and uh, the Commissioner of Human Rights mentioned that they have a new training as that they create as well. Do those two, are they the same? Do you two work together on that? 
So our training is um, specific to the city, is very much focused on the city human rights law, and our training is generally made available to the public since, you know, we have jurisdiction over both public and private uh, uh, employers and employees, and, uh, you know, I imagine the DCAS training is much more geared towards city employment. Yes, it is. Uh, but DCAS and the Commission on Human Rights do consult quite a bit on things yes. um, because DCAS is obviously very uh, uh, interested in making sure that they are compliant with the city human rights law, and they've been a great partner in doing these types of trainings. Okay, so we got it hot off the presses, but you already reviewed it and you love it. Um, or not. I don't it's know. Okay. I mean, it doesn't I, I matter. Don't I don't exactly know what you have in front of you right now, so I... No, she's okay, I guess I would just want to know. I mean, you were talking so in such a proud way about the new yep. training module that you had just come up yes. with, and I, I just wondered um, maybe if you could just confirm that they're in sync. They capture the same things. Of course, you're talking to the private sector as well. We can certainly make yes. sure they're consistent on the law. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, um, let's see, Deputy um, Commissioner, I'm going to get this right, Pinnock. Yes. If we could start with you. Um, tell me more about the EEO professionals, and this is what you were just talking about, at each of the agencies. Are they hired by the agency um, with certain criteria of what, uh, of their uh, what they need to know, or, or are they hired and vetted by DCAS? Um, what criteria is used for these professionals? And do some of the agencies have maybe uh, somebody who fills multiple jobs, CEO being one of, of several, and do you have a sense of how many agencies, you know, have people who are singularly focused on EEO. And I'm wondering if in each agency, if they report to the commissioner uh, themselves or if maybe they report through HR. So the EEO officers do report to the agency head. Each agency is required um, under the charter to have an appointed EEO officer. In terms of the onboarding process, um, specifically relating to budget and all of that, um, the EEO officer is hired by the agency. Notwithstanding, we are part of the vetting process um, specifically for individuals who are coming on at the most senior levels, assistant commissioner and above. Um, for other um, individuals who might be coming in at a different level within city government, we are still very much consulted with as it relates to the job posting um, to ensure that there's consistency, um, that there are any nuances or agency specific information that should be included. Um, and as part of our vetting process, when we sit down with the candidate, we sometimes use the information that we know about a particular agency to see how well we believe that they would fare based on organizational culture. Um, notwithstanding, we also provide um, an orientation with the EEO officers when they're brought on board. So our team, um, our team of seven, <laughs> um, they sit down with um, the newly appointed EEO officers and really explain what the charter requires, what their obligations are under the law. Um, it talks to them about the level of resource that they can expect from the citywide diversity and EEO office. Um, we sometimes provide them with a bit of a tutorial um, with respect to um, systems that we currently use, but we are very hands-on. Um, sorry, just to make no it clear, I, I didn't quite hear you. They all report directly to, to the, the commissioner. Head. Yes, they do. Okay. Yes, they do. Um, we also um, work directly with the EEO officers in terms of training. We provide a five-day intensive course where we not only review EEO policy and related employment laws and anti-discrimination laws, we also take them through the investigative process. We provide them with guidelines with respect to the investigative process, step-by-step -step instructions, and we do um, talk to them about matters relating to reporting, um, because that is a significant portion of their work, um, handling um, complaints and claims. Sorry, and just real quickly, will they all be uh, given refresher training with the new um, 
sexual harassment prevention program that you've come up with? Yes, we actually piloted this course with all of the EEO officers and the attorneys that we work with across the city. Um, the pilot um, was conducted in January, and that we had a host of focus groups whereby we received comments. You know, in some cases, folks wanted something that was a little more advanced. Um, some individuals thought that it was spot on, and so we incorporated the comments of our colleagues um, prior to um, finalizing um, the training. Oh, sorry, just real quickly, how many agencies do not currently, currently have a vacancy in the EEO uh, position? I don't know offhand. I can certainly provide that information. But also to your question relating to are there some cases where an EEO officer may have another hat? Yes. There are some cases, um, specifically for some of our smaller agencies, where the HR lead is also the EEO lead. Um, but I can certainly provide um, any known vacancy information. Yeah, I'd love to know that information. So specifically, uh, how many wear two hats? Um, and how many vacancies there are, and how many filled EEO positions there are. Um, and, and similarly, if you have a sense of turnover, are these people who are, uh, I don't know if you keep that information, but turnover would be interesting to know as well. Yes, another hat that I wear is um, I oversee human capital, so we do have um, turnover information, so I can certainly provide that. So convenient, <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so do you ever uh, currently, and, and again, and, you know, we're all just waking up, um, do you currently survey city employees to measure the extent to which they are familiar with the policy and that they're knowledgeable about how to report an incident? We conduct engagement surveys, however, that specific content has not been included. Um, and I'm happy that you mentioned that because when we saw the bill relating to the climate survey, we certainly think that the current engagement survey that we have potentially serves as a springboard for expansion um, where we could potentially include that information. And so you, so you do climate surveys now around other aspects yes. of um, EEO. What is the response rate overall or do some agencies, how often are they sent around? And if you could get us a sense of response rate, that would be really interesting. Um, I will definitely provide specifics on response rate, but I would say overall, we um, send out climate surveys relating to engagement, which is the one that I just um, talked to you about, but also relating to the um, how um, effective our training programs yeah. have been. Um, and so generally the response rates loom over 50%. So the EEO community tends to be very, very committed. This work is not for the faint of heart. Um, and so I, I can certainly provide you with the firm number as well. For the employees, are there certain titles that are required to get sexual harassment prevention training or do all employees get sexual harassment uh, prevention training? Yes, at the time that any employee with New York City is onboarded, part of your onboarding and new employee orientation consists of training, specifically on the EEO policy, and there's a specific section that covers sexual harassment. Within that particular um, training module, we talk about what it means to be a mandatory reporter. We outline the various ways in which you could file a complaint, whether you do that anonymously, um, whether you do it um, in writing. We also um, inform employees of their rights to submit a complaint external to their agency if they feel a need to do that. So yes, upon hire, every employee receives it, and every two years, um, the EEO training is required across the city. And how often is the climate survey sent out? The climate surveys really are tied. They're more so project-based. We, we have not had um, a specific Routinized. schedule relating to okay, that. OK, great. Mm -hmm. um, and is the, uh, does the policy include separate reporting requirements for managers or supervisors who uh, should be reporting on the incidents? Yes, the EEO policy, there's an accountability standards section, and specifically we talk about the role of managers, supervisors, and HR staff 
as mandatory reporters. And so um, essentially it informs them of the fact that when someone submits um, a complaint or if they learn or witness anything that they believe um, um, relates to discrimination or harassment in the workplace, they are required to share that information with an EEO officer. Um, in turn, when that information goes to an EEO officer, the investigative process um, would um, be initiated. Has anyone ever been reprimanded for not reporting? I'm not aware of any cases where that has happened. Okay. Um, if they were found not to report, what are the consequences? Um, if it is determined that they, and it's, it's found that they have not um, reported, um, then corrective action would ensue. That could um, be something as, um, it could run the gamut between a reprimand up into including termination. It would really depend on um, the nature of the complaint. Okay. Um, great, no cases. Uh, sorry, I'm just making sure I'm hearing you. Um, tell me more about the third party investigation process that the law department and DCAS does. Um, when, are, are there times when that process is not invoked? And what are the circumstances in which it is invoked? Um, the circumstances within which um, the process is invoked is when there is a conflict of interest. Excuse me essentially in an exceptional case whereby an agency head could be named as a respondent yeah. or they could be named as a witness or the EEO officer themselves named as a respondent or witness, those matters would be referred um, to DCAS. Um, as, as stated, we also work with our internal general counsel's office and the law department in working through um, the case and then conducting the appropriate investigation. At the time that we have um, rendered a determination to share, excuse me, when we've um, made a determination we're ready to share, we then send that information to the referring agencies, general counsel's office for review, and it is up to that um, general counsel's office then to proceed with the corrective action. And so um, I'm not aware of any cases in which that, um, that process has not been invoked. Um, I think that our EEO officers, um, as well as their general counsel offices um, at the various agencies, they tend to be pretty diligent about referring those cases that they believe um, that, they, that there are, there's a conflict of interest that exists. So how many times has it gone out of the agency uh, in the last year, just even a sense of numbers? And um, how do you know once it goes, the finding goes back to the general counsel whether or not um, there, the con there are consequences? Well, it's substantiated and what the consequences are. There certainly is follow-up with um, the agency with respect to um, how the um, determination was in fact adopted. And our general counsel's office, along with the support of the law department, follow up with the agency directly to ensure um, that uh, the corrective action has been implemented. Um, in terms of an actual number, similar to what you mentioned um, at the beginning of the hearing, we're still in a very um, intense and thoughtful process with reviewing all of our complaint data. And unfortunately, I don't have that number to share with you today. Do you find that, um, I know the, uh, the Equal Employment Practices Commission also does audits and identifies um, corrective actions. Have you ever uh, collaborated with them or um, find, found you know, um, validating work? that you do for each other? Um, certainly we consider the EEPC um, as a partner. They audit us as well, um, our HR function and our EEO okay. function. Um, but we do view them as a thought partner. So there are um, times when we do um, share information. There are times when um, the EPC has called on us if there was um, information they needed in the past. Have they ever called on you to um, work with the agencies <laughs> to comply with their recommendations? Um, I'm unaware of any cases. Okay. Um, could you uh, talk a little bit about um, filing a complaint anonymously? How would an, an employee know that they could do that and how to do that? 
Um, in the um, EEO training that they receive at the time that they're onboarded, um, they are also informed of their rights to submit an anonymous complaint. Um, additionally, as a complement to the EEO policy, we've created um, a handbook. It's called All About EEO, What You May Not Know. Um, it's written in a way that is very, very um, simple, but it's still very impactful. And it, it really emphasizes um, the appropriate way to submit a complaint. There's actually um, a list of steps for a complainant if they're seeking to file, where we advise them on you know, um, how to ensure that they have dates, names, places, you know, adding some specificity to their complaint that is laid out for them. Um, we also touch upon anonymous um, complaints. And so we receive those complaints sometimes via telephone or in writing. Um, and once we review that case, we then um, start our investigative process, similar okay. to how we would even if someone were to come in person. Do you have posters that get posted around um, at an agency for, you know, filing a complaint? No, I know that we have um, the resources on every agency's intranet site through the handbook, but certainly posters could be something we could explore. Okay, great. Uh, Councilmember Lander has a quick question. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm sorry, yes, I have to, I have to run. So this, this comes back to the human rights law, and, and I appreciate all the, this line of questioning, and I'm eager to follow up more on what we, what we can do in city agencies. But I um, uh, thank you guys for calling out some of the, the really good advocates and supporters in the crowd, like our friends at Hallaback. Seeing our friends from Planned Parenthood reminds me of a question that I wanted to ask. Uh, a friend of mine in the St. Louis City Council passed a law specifically prohibiting uh, discrimination or harassment based on, on reproductive choice and status, um, which then the Missouri State Legislature preempted and killed, mm -hmm. but that's unfortunately Missouri. Um, I wonder, is, you know, uh, is that co are, we, are we covered? Is that something that you've heard anything about and we should consider having covered? Um, you know, this was a more specific employment discrimination concern that women who had had abortions or made reproductive choices would face employer discrimination. Um, hopefully that's not happening, but uh, you can imagine a variety of different ways in which both harassment and discrimination might take place there, and I, I just wonder, do we consider that covered by gender discrimination in the law currently? Is it something you've heard anything about? Is it something we need to pay more attention to in this context? We've heard about the bill. Um, and kind of conceptually and subject matter wise, there are many ways in which I think some of the situations in which that type of discrimination would manifest itself would currently be covered under our law when you think of uh, broadly gender-based uh, protections, but also specifically, you know, our pregnancy accommodations provision uh, speaks broadly to pregnancy um, and pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. And certainly if one were to take a look at the legal enforcement guidance that we had released now, what, uh, 2016, um, there are some of the situations I think that would fall under um, you know, some of the circumstances you mentioned that we mention in our legal enforcement guidance. Okay. And Councilmember Williams whispers in my ear that he has that bill here in the New York City Council, so we don't have to look to Megan Green in St. Louis uh, for it. Um, okay, I'm glad that it's uh, that it's introduced that we're looking at it together and I uh, appreciate again all the and childbirth and related theory. conditions are also covered um, in the city's EEO policy. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, in my I want to welcome Council Member Jamani Williams to our hearing. Um, in my first year in the council, uh, we were looking at gender discrimination in the um, fire department, um, which, which seems to have its challenges. Um, could you talk about the varying organizational cultures across city agencies? Um, you know, Department of Sanitation, the fire department, ACS, and um, is there consideration of those cultural differences when you're providing information or collecting information from the different agencies? Yes, we do take that into consideration. And that's um, the reason why our relationship with the EEO officers is so important. 
Um, there have been times where in our best practices meetings, we've had um, discussions relating to the impact that culture has on um, systemic harassment and discrimination. Um, as a result, we have worked directly with some of our agency partners in terms of um, developing um, webinars. We've also worked with them. And in some cases, some of our larger agencies have greater resources to do this, where they've also cr um, created what they believe is agency-specific training to speak to some of those cultural differences. So while they use our EEO policy or sexual harassment information as a framework, they build upon that um, in order to um, provide scenarios that are very specific to their organizational culture. Do you have enough staff to spot check, to go to a fire station and look at a locker room, for example? Um, as it relates to our particular staff, I would say no. However, we do use our um, EEO officers, and also by extension, they have EEO liaisons that are um, sometimes um, unit-based or office-based to ensure that we um, broaden our network. Do you know of, of situations where they're spot checking in the fire department? I use them as an example mm -hmm. only because they're an obvious one, perhaps there are others as well, but you know, the information that I hear from um, the female firefighters about, you know, the, you know, the nude female calendars or, you know, inappropriate language on the walls um, is horrific and I'm just wondering, um, you know, who's, who, how often that's looked at, whether it's looked at. I'm unaware of any specific spot checks. However, I will tell you that we've been working very closely with the fire department in terms of enhancing um, their training offering. Okay, great. I actually am gonna um, ask Councilmember Williams if he's ready to ask questions. And I, I have a last question for you, but I'd like to let him do his thing. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Mine is um, um, more of a comment. Um, I just am um, sad that I have to be here. I'm grateful uh, for the leadership, particularly of uh, the women of council, for, for uh, pushing this issue. Of course, Council Member <coughs> Rosenthal. But, you know, I myself, just as a male, wanted to speak about being able to check my male privilege uh, to be able to listen uh, to what was going on. Uh, particularly this year and this past year, and hashtag Me Too. Um, I remember when we had a hearing around um, street hails, a street whistling, I think it's called. Um, what's it called? Street harassment, yes. It, it was eye opening to me, uh, just again, as a privileged male, sometimes you don't understand what the impact is. And then to hear women speaking about the impact, and from the time, I guess, maybe even hitting puberty to just go get some milk. Uh, becomes a, a, a big hassle. And then again, hearing these stories as they came out, there were, there were two things that helped. One was, again, my male privilege. Sometimes you have an immediate reaction. I may not have to be the best. And then I also remembered uh, my experience uh, as a black person and talking about things that I had and the ways that you have to survive as a black person at work, at school, going through society made me pause. Uh, and then listening to young uh, to women I cared about around me, start describing what they had to go through through work and the things that just were appalling as I heard it. And they spoke as if, as, as if it was something that bothered them, but something they had to endure in order to continue employing and moving up the ladder. And those things were uh, just uh, appalling to hear repeated over and over and over as a systemic thing that is being accepted. Um, so I am you know, proud to be co-sponsoring one of these bills. Um, I'm proud that all of these things are now getting the light they deserve. I think one of the big problems is that we allowed it to hide in plain sight for way too long. Uh, and so I, I'm glad to see that hopefully this might provide some relief that people have experienced, but more importantly, hopefully it will prevent people from experiencing it uh, even further. And so, as I said in the, in the press conference, there's just really, there was no excuse before, there definitely is no excuse uh, now, and hopefully these laws will help push that back. I want to highlight one thing that I read here from Tyler Evans, I'm not sure if she's here, I just happened to be reading, she's 15 years old, she goes to Brooklyn Tech, uh, which is on my alma mater, so it just struck me of um, not even having thought through high school, just reviewing things that many people may have thought uh, was okay that wasn't. And so these young people are bringing this up now, just horrible examples. and of a teacher saying, baby, turn me on, 
uh, to her favorite male students, one teacher uh, who's better to give, who's known to give better grades to certain female students and touch their shoulders. Um, she had a great idea that she said that they bring uh, speakers about um, bullying to the schools that the students really listen to, but none around sexual harassment. And so maybe that's something uh, that can also be put in um, to schools as well. So I just wanted to highlight her um, experience here. But thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'm very excited that we're, we're doing this. Sad that we have to, but I want to thank you for your leadership and others in the council. Uh, thank you, Council Member Williams. Okay, I have to say this. Council Member Williams, what I really appreciate about you is you are currently the only council member who has um, a pledged to support a woman f following you in the council, um, ensuring that a woman would get elected. And given that there are only 11 of 51 council members who are women, we need more of our um, colleagues to step up in the way that you have. So um, you've, you, you have cred with me. Well, thank you. <laughs> hope I, I hope I just didn't piss off my other colleagues, but I'm excited we have a, uh, a slew of candidates yeah. Yeah. Uh, who are women, so I'm very excited. And also, I want to make sure I wasn't equating my experience as a black person with the experience of a woman. I just want to make sure I, I put that out there, but it was helpful. I'm walking the same tightrope. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one more quick question for you, Deputy Commissioner. Could you describe how each agency or give us a sense of the variety and how agencies keep track of complaints? And I know you're working on, but could you just confirm for the record that you're working on a central uh, d database where you would be collecting the same information from every agency? and? Um, does this require new software, or how does this work? Um, so prior to um, fiscal year 2014, um, each agency um, really followed a paper-based um, um, com complaint filing system. Um, in fiscal year 2014, um, there was more of an automated process um, put in place. Um, that being said, we are at a point where we are trying to confirm that there's been consistency with the use you know, of the systems, as well as a consistency with the understanding of the various categories within the system. So that's part of our overall review. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I think that I forgot your last question. You asked. That is a sea change, it. what you already described. Okay. Um, and so we actually have created what um, could be a really solid central repository of information. Yeah. That is the reason why we just need to go through this very thorough review to ensure that there's a clear interpretation of the policies that guide use of the system as well as the usage of the system. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, if I could just ask just very few questions, because we've sure. already talked so much, you've already answered so much. Um, you mentioned that 117, there were 117 uh, claims um, in 2017, and that that is an increase, and I know so much work goes into addressing each complaint. Um, but we also know that it's probably a drop in the bucket compared to what's out there. I'm wondering if you have the resources that you need first to do a public educa education campaign, which I'm really excited about and excited to learn more about and help with in any way we can. Um, but then, you know, should there be 500 complaints, 1,000 complaints, um, do you have the resources that you need? You know, there's a few things I would say to that. Um, one, you know, my in my previous life, so to speak, before uh, heading the agency, I was uh, a lawyer who did employment law uh, for a living and did employee-related employment law, including, of course, sexual harassment-related claims. Um, and having that experience, I also know that there are many reasons that people don't necessarily come forward and file at an agency. Um, everyone's experience, I think, is very unique. Yeah. And people's situations and the, the vulnerabilities that people have, the priorities that people have in their personal lives are very distinct. Uh, and there are certainly many situations in which rather than choosing to file at an agency, which could be considered something of an escalation, there are many times where employees uh, will, with or without counsel, speak directly to 
their employer's HR department or EO officers or, you know, take other methods or uh, utilize other methods in order to resolve what their situation is. Uh, for that number, also specifically at the commissioner, I would say that there are many instances in which depending on, you know, the needs of the complainants coming forward, uh, the commission also tries to expedite certain types of cases. And in some situations, that means not even filing a complaint, but reaching out to the employer, reaching out to the business and trying to resolve that claim more expeditiously because the circumstances demand it, frankly. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I, I wanna just be clear on what that metric may or may not also be including. Uh, I think, of course, any agency head would be happy to have resources. That's always a wonderful thing to, to, to think about. Um, like I said earlier, we are already planning a, uh, you know, a modest uh, campaign uh, on sexual harassment, on the city human rights law and what it covers, and on the, the resources available at, on, uh, at our agency that uh, will be coming out this spring. Okay. Um uh, by the way, does your office offer uh, mediation services? We do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, apart from those complaints filed with the with your um, Commission on Human Rights, do you have an idea of how many sexual harassment complaints are filed in New York City? In New York City, meaning in state court? No, city. Um, oh. So I, I'm, Could I, be. I'm just, so apart from the ones that are filed at our agency, when you say complaints filed, do you mean in court, in federal court or state court? I'm just trying to clarify the question. No, I appreciate, yeah. I and mean, I'm thinking of what the answer is. Um, certainly yes, for cases that may have gone that far or that route, but perhaps there are other places that collect this information that we're not thinking about right now. The district on the, uh, the the federal EEO, for example. Um, I'm not aware of that of that number. Okay. So I think there, there's probably, you know, many different um, ways of kind of slicing that, that cake, so to speak, and um, depending on which, uh, you know, which units or which communities you're looking at. So I'm not aware of numbers beyond the stats that we keep for complaints filed at the agency. And I mean, we could also get back and to you. We could, I'm happy to get back course, to you. Of course, of course. It's just sort of an interesting thought that there are other places out there that might be collecting this information that we could tap into and know about to make sure that, or yeah, to know, for example, um, you know, the impact of your education program. Perhaps if there were some other place that's collecting this information, we would want to see the numbers go up or go down, or we would just want to see what direction they go in. Um, so there's a, there are a few different venues that might be available to people, including the New York State Division on Human Rights, um, and then the federal EEOC, right. which has offices in New York City. One question, though, that, that, that I don't know, and we can get back to you on, is whether they actually publish data specific to the five boroughs, or if they, yep. as, as the commissioner said, sort of slice it in different ways. But we can look into that, and also state court and federal court that might be litigating under our law and using our broad standard, but we would not see that at the commission. I really appreciate it. You totally answered my question because I think their number was 7,000, the federal EEOC, and I had no context of what that was. So thank you. I really appreciate your expertise and looking at that. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, do you have any other questions? Uh, probably one or two questions because uh, uh, I remember that you mentioned that uh, there are training available for the staff. Is that correct? In the training. Who are we talking? Where? Commissioner. Training. What for type staff? of training? Yeah, training. So available. there are a few different types. What of type of training? Sure. Available for the staff, for the supervisors, and the Human Rights Commission, in order for them to be able and prepare to address uh, the uh, uh, harassment issues. So, um, so agency heads have the discretion to mandate trainings for their staff. Uh, we currently have several trainings internally that are mandated for all of my staff, uh, which include the Human Rights 101 training that's for all employees so that everyone, since we are the Commission on Human Rights, have a good understanding as to what the law covers. 
We have language access training, uh, Transgender 101, working with transgender people in their communities type training, working with people with disabilities, working with victims of domestic violence, sexual harassment in the workplace, conflicts of interest training, computer-based EEO training, diversity and inclusion, everybody matters, the DCAS training, uh, as well as the unconscious bias DCAS training. In terms of uh, training you know, to address the sexual harassment, how many times they take place? How often they take place? Uh, is that a monthly, annually? Well, sexual harassment training is covered um, in the city's EEO policy. Uh -huh. So every employee receives that training upon hire and then every two years thereafter as a refresher. And, and within my agency, it's with annually, every year. But how do you measure, because every time that we are doing something, regardless of the area, we have to take a moment to evaluate, to quantify you know, the effect or the benefit or the success of what we are doing. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of those training? Uh, well, one, I think, you know, we, so every year we are re-examining our uh, EO plan and we're re-releasing an EO plan to agency staff. And the, uh, the, our EO plan has a statement of diversity principles. It has a statement of, um, you know, what we want in, in terms of our aspiration for diversity and inclusion within the agency. There's a statement as to who the different EO officers are within the agency. In my agency, the head EO officer is also my chief of staff, and that is meant to communicate the importance to which uh, we put on this issue. Um, and so part of the, the process of doing that annually is to receive feedback from staff members. Um, everyone knows <coughs> when I send it out that they're able to approach me or any number of the other common, uh, people that are identified as EEO members within my staff so that they can talk to them about any uh, interests or concerns or, or additions that they would want to make to anything in our diversity plan. And Thank there you. are also quarterly updates made to those annual plans at the commissioner. Thank you very much. Let me ask my last question, very quick. Uh, first, uh, uh, first of all, let me thank you, you know, all the members of the panel for the effort that you have been doing to address this very, very important issue we are all concerned about. Uh, but uh, if you have to do something more than what you are doing right now to better address the issue of sexual harassment, what it would be? Oh, let me put it in another way. Because my father usually said that, my son, there's no perfection. There's no perfection. We, every time we got to evaluate what we are doing and improve it and do more to reach our goal, what do you believe that should be done from your institution and together with the city council? What can we do as a city, as a society, to ensure that we can decrease because one of the th things also we observed that the, the, there was an increase of the complaint for sexual harassment. So I don't know how we interpret that, what is, what, what is the take on that, but what can we do to decrease the number of sexual harassment? Or what is the biggest challenge for you in your effort to address the sexual harassment? I think, you know, the reality is in a city of more than eight and a half million, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. That's frankly one of the reasons we held our hearing on December 6th and we wanted a diversity of different industries and workers and workers' advocates represented because we wanted to hear, you know, there are certain industries in which people are very isolated and so the challenges they face are specific to that type of isolation. There are certain industries that are considered non-traditional professions for women and there are certain challenges that they face. There are certain challenges faced by domestic workers, by immigrant workers, by LGBTQ workers. And so, um, you know, when I, I keep mentioning this report that we're putting out in April. It is really meant to think through the diversity of different industries and workplaces that we have in New York City. It certainly would not be able to cover every single industry or every single workplace because we are New York City. Um, but it is meant to cover many of the, um, of the different types of experiences, uh, at least that were raised in oral or written testimony at that hearing. Um, and I think, 
you know, I think to uh, working with all of the different city partners, whether it's businesses or schools or houses of faith or the city council, and helping folks be introspective about, you know, how they can be uh, uh, including best practices in their own places of employment is a very important thing, and that's something that we try to do daily. Uh, you know, with the work we do, especially with the community service centers we have in each one of the boroughs and in the policy work that we do at the agency. So I think there are a variety of ways in which we are still, you know, hearing experiences, thinking through what are the best ways of, um, of uh, recognizing and addressing those situations. And I imagine my, my great hope, as Chair Rosenthal had said earlier uh, in the hearing, was that you know what, what the city is doing right now is a beginning and that there will be more conversations to be had. There'll be more uh, uh, conversations and experiences to be aired. Um, and, and I'll leave it to my colleague to. Thank you. Um, there are um, a few things that we are actually considering now. And one of the first is really to create better synergy between our EEO and our HR leads. Um, there are often times when there are complaints that come into an EEO officer mm -hmm. that are more appropriate for our HR lead to handle. Um, also, there's data that the two groups can really share to really drill down to see where you're receiving the most complaints. Is it indicative of the culture of this particular department? Has there been a shift in leadership? Has it been some kind of organizational change that's contributed to some of the data we're seeing? So I definitely think creating that synergy, which is something we're actively working to do, having the EEO team and the human capital team work together at DCAS is a model that we really want to share and, um, and, and model for the entire city of New York. Um, also, we would like to explore streamlining some of our reporting requirements. Currently, the charter requires that individual agencies send their data to the EEPC, the council, the mayor's office. We believe that since we provide a citywide function, it's, it's a far better service if we're able to provide all of that information for our city partners where there would just be one file. So we're all speaking from the same place as it relates to um, any complaint data that we receive. And lastly, you know, and this is really my pitch for the EEO officers, they work extremely hard. And so we're trying to think about ways in which to better support them at the time that they are onboarded, providing them with more information about their agency, really holding their hands a little bit as they get acclimated to their respective agency um, to ensure that we're increasing retention within that group, but also that they know that every step of the way, since they serve as our eyes and ears, that we are here to support them. Thank you very much uh, to all of you, and thank you also for the wonderful job that your institutions are doing to address the uh, uh, sexual harassment issue. And we and the City Council, we are dedicated to work together with you because we are part of the same team. We are all in this together. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm not sure I agree with you about the curtailing the data reporting, so it's going to be really interesting to talk about and follow up with. Um, and we're going to hear next from the EEPC, so I'll be curious to know their thoughts about that. But I very much appreciate what you're saying in terms of there being so much data and sort of, you know, Who's looking at it? Who's mm -hmm. analyzing it? Is it consistent across the city? So We'd love to work with you on that. Great. So Deputy Commissioner Pinnock, really appreciate your time. Thank you. um, Commissioner Malalas, Deputy Commissioner Sussman, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your time. Next, you. we are going to call up the Equal Employment Practices Commission. Um, so Sharice Terry, Elaine Reese, uh, J. Patrick Boyle, and um, Ayasia as well. And I apologize if I just butchered your name. So if the reporters could take it out in the hall, and if we could 
so if the reporters could take it out in the hall and we could uh, hear now from the EEPC and I'm hoping that someone from City Hall stays back and um, will hear the rest of today's, will be here for the rest of today's hearing. All right. Um, okay. Is it on? So, yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Could you uh, t please introduce yourselves and start? And if it's all right, only because of the lateness of the day, I'm going to put everyone on the clock. I'm sorry, um, we're gonna start with, um, and this is generous, I know you're not gonna feel that way, but we're gonna start with three minutes each, and then uh, a little later we're gonna switch down to two, and I apologize for that, but just so everyone gets ready, and I know that the questioning uh, from council members will be less, so don't, so uh, thank you everyone for your time. If you could I start, thank, Commissioner uh, Reese. Council member. Uh, Rosenthal and Councilmember Eugene for the invitation to come and talk to you to you today. I want to thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for bringing your staff over and trying to learn about what the EEPC does. I want to thank you as well for sharing the legislation with you and having read it. And after our explanation today, you will discover why I, for one, think we need to work with you on the legislation because we do think some of it is duplicative and redundant on what we already do and what we already have been doing for a while. Um, and I do want, for the record, to once more make the offer that we did the other day, which is to say we would like to meet with all the new council members to explain what the EEPC does. And with, I'm, I am finished now. I am a, a commissioner of the EEPC. I am a mayoral appointee. You will understand better what that means in about half a second. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Eugene. Uh, my name is Cherise Terry. I am the Executive Director of the Equal Employment Practices Commission. And I'll just jump right into my testimony. You can introduce yourselves when you present testimony. Uh, the commission, um, this commission represented by Elaine Reese appears before you today to present testimony on its role in instituting best practices and policies for the prevention of sexual harassment in city government. Created by the New York City Charter, the Equal Employment Practices Commission is an independent non-mayoral agency empowered to monitor and evaluate city agencies to ensure that they maintain effective equal employment opportunity or EEO for employees and applicants from protected groups. Agencies which fall under this commission's jurisdiction are those that are funded in whole or in part by the city treasury, those which the majority of the board members are appointed by the mayor, or those which the majority of the board members serve by virtue of being city officers. In order to promote equal employment opportunities, Chapter 36 of the city charter authorizes the EPC to monitor the coordination of affirmative employment programs established by the city, monitor the employment pro policies, programs, practices of city agencies, ensure compliance with the city's human rights law, state and federal anti-discrimination laws and the EEPC standards, and propose poli policy, legislative, and or regulatory recommendations to the Mayor, New York City Council, and Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Chapters 35 and 36 of the New York City Charter assigns to the EPC powers and duties geared towards the maintenance of equal employment opportunity programs, which include but are not limited to reviewing and providing suggestions on the uniform standards, procedures, and programs of DCAS, as well as the plans adopted by city agencies, auditing and evaluating the programs, policies, and procedures of city agencies and their efforts to ensure fair and effective equal employment opportunity at least once every four years. I'll skip forward a bit. Making policy and legislative and budget, budgetary recommendations to the mayor, city council, DCAS, and city agencies as, seem, as deemed ne necessary to ensure equal employment opportunity within the city of New York, and requesting and receiving from any city agency information and such assistance as may be necessary to carry out the provisions of this charter. To effectuate the aforementioned provisions, the city charter assigns a board of five 
per diem commission members. The board is, a, is comprised of two appointees from the mayor, two from the city council, and the chair is jointly appointed by the mayor and the speaker of the council who all serve in staggered four-year terms. This arrangement is intended to ensure balance. You know what, we're gonna go off the clock. That's all right, keep going. Cause I see I'm now that you've split it up. So right. yeah, we have. if you could, but it, look at your testimony, if you could sum it up in some way. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, this arrangement is intended to ensure uh, balance and insulation from political influence and facilitate exercise of jurisdiction over the employment practices of mayoral and non-mayoral agencies, as well as the offices of elected officials and political appointees. Sexual harassment impacts employment decisions and unreasonably in interferes with the work performance, thereby creating a barrier to equal employment opportunities. The city charter authorizes the EPC to audit and evaluate the employment practices and procedures of city agencies and their efforts to ensure fair and effective equal employment opportunity for females and minority group members. Thus, the EPC has developed audit protocols that focus on the prevention of and protection from sexual harassment. I'm going to skip forward just to, to save time. Today, we have personnel from the EPC's research unit and audit units to describe the role the EPC has and will assume in addressing the prevention of sexual harassment in New York City government via its audit mandate. I'll come back to this one. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Boyle, Director of Research Initiatives and Public Hearings of the EEPC's Research Unit. In 2018, the Equal Employment Practices Commission commenced its audit plan using a sexual harassment prevention audit, SHPA. In preparation for this type of audit, the EEPC has requested citywide complaint information from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Office of Citywide Diversity and Equal Employment Opportunity, the EPC also requests from an agency during its audit a breakdown of the number of and types of discrimination complaints filed internally and externally. This audit is intended to prepare agencies to address potential issues involving sexual harassment, failure to carefully, stra carefully craft strategies preventing the occurrence of sexual harassment, or the inability to manage complaints that may be filed as a result of an incident are costly, not only in terms of financial resources, but also the detrimental effects resulting in a hostile workplace, cultural discord, and negative public image. The SHPA will assist agencies with implementing corrective actions intended to ensure compliance with federal, state, and local laws via the standard EEPC audit process. In addition, the audit can provide agencies with insight identified by the EEPC and guidelines proposed by authorities such as the EEOC and State Division of Human Rights. The SHPA framework examines a series of equal employment inter intertwined components as sexual harassment prevention initiatives must remedy, must remedy a systemic disruption of the workplace. These components span the entirety of the workforce structure. Senior leadership, human resources departments, equal employment offices, learning and development functions, managers, and most importantly, the individuals, employees, all play vital roles in the prevention and protection initiative. The initial component focuses on the formal sexual harassment policy that is set forth by the organization. The policy must contain certain elements that define the issues and procedures while clarifying roles and responsibilities of every employee. This policy should include the obligation to report incidents, how to file complaints, transparent investigatory processes, as well as potential disciplinary actions. The next component focuses on the importance of leadership action. For successful sexual harassment prevention initiatives, leadership must commit to assigning the required resources, e.g. time, budget, and labor resources, etc. This includes effective communications to management and other key stakeholders about the value of leadership accountability and constant vigilance to identify potential risk. This vigilance requires cultural awareness and a commitment to workforce data analyses. Another component examines the available sexual harassment reporting and tracking system. The ideal process has guidelines in place that assist complainants and investigators through the process in a timely, well-documented, and efficient manner. Given the sensitive nature of reporting these events, a procedure that guarantees expedience, confidentiality, and anonymity when requested for the complainant or whistleblower if must I be in place. If I could ask you to wrap it up. We have your testimony, and, and you should know this as well. We have it for the file. If you could just hit the, the main punch lines, we'd appreciate it. Definitely. Good afternoon. My name is Aisha Zool, the manager 
of EEO analysis and EEPC audit unit. I didn't turn on my mic. Can you hear me? Um, an EEPC audit unit, and I will be concluding the testimony. The EEPC's audit unit consists of one manager, myself, and four to five EEO program analysts. The EEO program analysts administer audits and serve as a resource to the EEPC executive director and board members for any audit findings and conclusions. Um, this, this section is about uh, our powers, um, so I'll just skip down. So during the uh, SHPA and EEO program analysts will review and examine the complaint and investigation component of an agency's EEO program to ascertain whether the agency has established meaningful and responsive procedures for receiving and investigating sexual harassment complaints. The agency's complaint tracking and monitoring system, the number and types of sexual harassment complaints the, agencies, the agency has received, the ability to, of personnel to, I'm sorry, the ability of personnel dedicated to complaint intake and investigation, redacted complaint files and supporting documentation that demonstrates complaints are, were investigated, a determination was made and remedial action was documented and the roles and responsibilities of the EEO personnel, the agency council, and the agency head in complaint investigation procedures. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is uh, amazing, just amazing. I mean, and what you were just talking about, could you, so, and I know you collect this information into reports that are sent around, but would you be a source of information, would EEPC be a source of information to know how many complaints were filed, sexual harassment complaints were filed um, last year or the year before, the, the year with most recent? I suspect it, where the response will be after we continue, we complete the analysis of all the agencies, and I think as we have stated to you uh, privately, we do a quarter of them annually, we are beginning the sexual harassment, and if you will, analysis. And so four years from today, we can tell you that. What we hope we can tell you next year as we look at it is what the report is for a, a good third of the workforce within the city, which is what we're trying to do with putting together our what agencies we're going to look at next year. Am I correct? Yes. I appreciate that. Help me understand why, it, what it, the the depth of what you're doing, so that it will take four years to answer the question. Because we go through each, we do it by going. We do 35 agencies a year, so our numbers would only be. And remember, it is what has happened as opposed to what might happen. It's right. not current. It is historic. We're, we therefore will be able to tell you as to last year what happened in the 35 agencies we looked at and therefore what for the term we look at it. So we look at it for I guess is it a two year term or a three year term? Okay. Um, I'll answer. I, I'll try to answer it a little. Look, I know this is a con uh, what I like is I know you're thinking hard about it and right. that you understand that it's multifaceted. So okay. In 2014 and 2015. As uh, uh, we discussed, um, the EPC conducted an uh, audit called the Discrimination Complaint and Investigation Procedures Audit. Back then, we received aggregate data from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, which you spoke to today. Since they are currently mining the data, and I guess maybe speaking with agencies on how the data is being reported, as Don Pinnock uh, testified to. The information that we rece we've received since then, because we don't receive the information in aggregate from DCAS anymore, has been from individual agencies during an audit. So okay, that's why so Commissioner Reese got is saying it. that. The last time you got an annual summary was, two th four, was 2014. for 2014. And is that a calendar year or a fiscal year? A fiscal year. Okay. And um, do you happen to remember what the number of sexual harassment complaints were uh, citywide? And, and while 
Patrick is looking that up. Um, do you um, uh, do you think that data systems are in place with the city agencies and between the agencies and DCAS or the agencies and you to report this information almost, uh, you know, in a um, as it's happening fashion or uh, do those data systems not exist yet? Usually, what, what we found back then was that every city agency, well, mayoral agencies, I should say, right. reported to, to DCAS right. uh, through a quarterly system of reporting. And that quarterly system was um, everyone's using the same type of spreadsheet that can talk to each other? or First, it was done by spreadsheet, and then there was an electro electronic system that was developed that allowed agencies to log on and, and log in the information. However, that is the system that's currently being checked. Got it. So, so the most recent system is one where every agency can log in, submit their numbers. Right. Um, and when was the last year that they were doing spreadsheets? Do you remember? You don't have to remember. 2015. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. right. That's when we received the last Got it. sheet. Right. For 2014. Right. Okay. And so do you want to... Do you have to... access to that data portal where they are entering, agencies are entering the information? The EPC has requested access. You've, uh, that was going to be my next question. Do you think you should have access to that portal? Absolutely. Yes. Right. We've requested access and so we're awaiting access. Could you submit, has that, was that a request made orally or in writing? In writing. In, in writing. writing. Could you submit that for, for our records, sure. that request? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we have the number that you asked. Oh, you thank you. Patrick? So the, the last reports that we received were quarterly reports, and we received three of them. So. The best we could do was pull together the three quarters and give you the summary. And um, a three quarter total for Q2 2015 to Q4 2015 um, was 78 total sexual harassment complaints filed. So I'm sorry, could you just repeat that one more time? Sure. I heard up to CUNY. So um, Q2 to Q4 of fiscal year 2015 is the data that we have. During that three quarter period, um, there were 78 sexual harassment complaints filed. For what agencies? For all agencies. That's an aggregate. That's an aggregate. aggregate all mayoral According agencies. to the information. That, okay. And, and right, this is, this is mayoral agencies specifically. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're not including um, NYCHA. We're not including H&H. &H. Um, does it include SCA? Not including the DOE. I was just going to ask. DOE and SCA not included. Okay. Um, so is it, uh, do you, how, how would the EEPC have a sense of whether or not the systems in place at agencies are conducive to employees making a complaint? Does that wait for an audit for that to happen? Or do you have other mechanisms for looking at that? The, the city charter, uh, ch chapter 35, mm -hmm. uh, dictates that city agencies should submit an agency-specific plan on their efforts to implementing equal employment opportunity, as well as quarterly re reports on their quarterly efforts to implementing the plan. Efforts plan. meaning like a qua qualitative report. It's qualitative and quantitative. So that report would have data that indicates whether or not employees were trained. It would have uh, whether or not they hired new e EEO staff. All of the efforts that they've taken to implement whatever the, the EEO plan was for that year. Do that's any the, also the data, excuse me, that's also the, the report that would include the complaint information. 
So Councilwoman Rosenthal, I think you're asking a, a rather difficult question and I don't think we can really respond to it. And that is that while we will audit what the rules require, I don't think we can really audit culture and the cultural change that this hearing is trying to bring about. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can tell you what we will discover with the data. We can tell you what, what standards are in place. We can tell you the number of people who complained. We cannot tell you the number of people who did not complain. We cannot tell you the number of people who felt that if they came forward to complain, that no one would listen. Uh, we can't, what we do is really assess the data, and even though we look at it qualitatively, what we can't tell you about is what's not there. And do you think that your commission should have the responsibility to do that? In other words, to do a climate survey? I'm <laughs> this commission has conducted surveys in the past, not specifically on sexual harassment. However, a part of the survey was concerning whether or not sexual harassment training was done. It was under the, the question about EEO training in general. Okay. It's very difficult for us. Why? Because we're 14 people. Because 14 staff. And we, and, right, and our head count was recently, within the last, let's say, five years, we increased it, to, we increased to 14. The, okay. the manager of the audit unit, as she just said, it's her and about four to five analysts. So it's much more difficult for us to do a survey because we need cooperation from the agency and you know, agencies don't always like to cooperate during an audit. But according to the charter, they have to, is that right? Correct, we try to make them just <laughs> cooperate. But, but they have- Just wanted that for the record. But they have their own problems. For example, the parks department, just use it as an example. Uh, how are you gonna survey them? They don't have computers, much as we would like to believe everybody does. Uh, there isn't really the central location. Uh, we've looked at it as being, I mean, there, there are several different problems di differing with who the employees are and how you, how you would get the response. So I, I'm not well, making another excuses. Problem with the I'm not making excuses for anybody. I'm just indicating that we could undertake to do it. That doesn't mean our response rate would be, uh, depending on the, on the particular agency, we might have trouble with it. And we could do it now. I mean, we, could, we have the authority. It isn't, I don't think that's the issue. Yep. Uh, and we are auditing, we have created, because we too know about the Me Too movement, we have created a sexual harassment uh, uh, survey, if you will, or a mechanism to look at it throughout the agencies. It just, based on the way we function, will take us four years to know the entire city's employment base. You know, it's interesting that you bring up parks. Many of their workers are contracted workers, um, which adds another layer. So I must put, for the record, Commissioner, I must say that we audit about 35 agencies per year, sometimes more. Uh, I anticipate that with the new abbreviated sexual harassment audit, we would be able to do that audit faster because it's more specific. Right than looking at all of the complaints that agencies may have. And that will be, we will be implementing that audit for our 2018 to 2020 audit protocol or audit plan and protocol. Have you, I'm pretty sure this is in, in your purview, have you looked at the new training modules that CCHR and DCAS we're talking about? We looked at the new DCAS training mo module, yes. I guess it was just issued yesterday. So I we don't had, know at I the could... point when we received it, it was a pilot. Okay. Did you have input um, on into their final uh, program policy? I would want to, to I, I'm not sure which one that one is. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. This is uh, an online training, uh, sexual harassment prevention, what to know about unlawful and inappropriate behaviors in the workplace. Um, it's the, tr the training that they um, came out with yesterday uh, as a result of that 
pilot. That one seems, I don't think we've received that one. This is just a Xerox mm -hmm. of the website. Okay, I'd be interested in your um, opinion on that later. Um, let's see. Um, have you been asked by the administration to do an audit on any specific agency as it has to do with sexual harassment? No. Okay. Um, and have you made recommendations or monitored an agency as a result of that agency's sexual harassment policies uh, or practices? In the course of doing a general EEO yeah. program audit, we have recommended during that audit that sexual harassment is added to maybe the training curriculum because we do review training curriculum or we may recommend that sexual harassment is added to a policy or a policy statement. Yep, and in that audit, do you have a sense, which I understand you have a limited amount of staff and a limited number of, of agencies that you can audit, but do you have a sense of um, how many agencies maybe did not have a thorough sexual harassment training program? Most agencies either follow the mayor's EEO policy, which includes a sexual harassment statement and a description and okay. directions on who to contact if there is sexual harassment. And those are the mayoral agencies. The non-mayoral agencies, quite a few of them model their policies off of the mayor's policy. Is anyone looking at the non-mayoral? We are. We audit 141 agencies. Including the non-mayoral? Right, we have agencies that are under our jurisdiction that are non-mayoral, like the community colleges, the district attorneys, the borough presidents. And the DAs uh, may or may not respond, comply, public everyone. Advocates. Everybody responds. Not gonna throw rocks. Um, <laughs> Everybody okay. responds. Okay. Uh, great. I want to thank you so much for coming today. We heard you. Um, we're going to be meeting with you a lot more. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. And if you could, as a follow-up, and you mentioned this, Commissioner Reese, um, to the extent to which the pieces of legislation that we're talking about today duplicate effort, uh, if you could write us a memo or a your thoughts about that, that would be very much appreciated quickly. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. I'm next going to call up a first round of, of um, non-city people. Um, Adira Simon for Catherine Wild of the Partnership for New York, Emily May from Hollaback, Meredith Mascara, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, from Girl Scouts of the Greater New York, and Allegra Fischel um, from Gender Equality Law Center. How many more? Um, yeah, I'm going to try very hard, although you can tell it's not in my nature to hold you to a timeline. But if you could work very, very hard not to read your testimony, most everyone's testimony we have, and to summarize it, that would be very much appreciate. I'm going to ask the partnership to go first. Thank you. I'm reading the testimony, as you said, of Catherine Wild, President and CEO. She wanted to be here in person, but she had a conflict this afternoon. Right, but I give you the authority to summarize. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a number of New York's firms are global leaders in establishing policies and training programs to prevent or address sexual harassment. And long before the Me Too movement, most employers understood the importance of creating corporate cultures in which employees treat each other with respect. And in response to heightened awareness of workplace sexual harassment, most employers are taking the opportunity to assess their current practices and make improvements as needed. We would respectfully suggest 
that many employers have more knowledge and experience than the city council regarding best practices for prevention, training, and responding to sexual harassment. The partnership would be pleased to identify some of these employers and facilitate meetings with council members and staff to inform your consideration of proposed laws. We believe this input would be critical to achieve your objective of a harassment-free workplace. The bills under consideration today have only been available for a few days and therefore have not been reviewed by employers. We are sure that the council wants to enact legislation that encourages employers to act in the best interests of their employees without placing an undue administrative burden on those who are already doing the right thing. We hope the council will be deliberative about its response to this important issue and take the time for consultation. We are most willing to help in this process. Got it. And sure, we'd, be, we'd welcome that, absolutely. Um, my scheduler can be reached, <laughs> nterrace at council.nyc.gov. We eagerly await meeting with you. Is that better? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Emily May. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you some cliff notes since you have a copy of my testimony. Um, as you probably already know, Hollaback addresses harassment in all of its forms. What I want to do today um, is underscore a little bit for you some of the forms of harassment that employees are facing um, that we don't always think about when we think about workplace harassment, particularly harassment that happens on the street, especially during people's commutes, um, and harassment that's happening online while people are at work. Um, and then I want to highlight a couple recommendations that we have in response to the um, amazing amount of legislation that you guys have put forward. Um, so in terms of the commute, what we see um, pretty consistently happening is when people are harassed on their commute to work, um, they show up to work distracted. Um, it's hard to work, right? They'll try to take a longer route to work to uh, even, we've even heard people leaving jobs to avoid harassment. Um, and so uh, we've partnered with Cornell to do research um, on this issue and, and have noted that you know, the same effects that happen with any kind of sexual harassment in the workplace, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder are also showing up related to street harassment when people are just trying to get to work. And the same employee, employer impacts are showing up, impacting punctuality, attendance, productivity, healthcare costs, morale, et cetera. Um, and I bring this to your attention because one of the things that we learned from the amazing work done on workplace harassment in the 80s and 90s is that it wasn't really until we had an assessment of the financial cost to employers that sexual harassment was, was taking um, on them, like a very, very numeric money cost for employers, that employers really showed up um, and took leadership on this. And so I think gathering research on this issue is really key. Um, also, oh my goodness, three more. Three minutes was quick. <laughs> online harassment. <laughs> Extra one. <laughs> just quickly, online harassment um, uh, is another uh, key issue, um, particularly faced by journalists and anybody who's required to hold a personal social media account um, uh, for their work. So a recent poll of Time Writers, for example, showed that 80% of people avoided topics to avoid harassment. Um, we worked significantly with BuzzFeed to address this issue, and we have a, a guide as well that we've done with um, the Mozilla Foundation and uh, the Kairos Fellowship on how to address this. So jumping ahead to quick recommendations, um, uh, love the fact that you guys are looking at training for employers on harassment. Would encourage you to also look at how street harassment and online harassment are impacting their employees. Um, and also want to push you to move beyond um, looking at uh, what's in the legislation as, quote, the importance of bystander intervention, and actually looking tactically at teaching employees what bystander intervention looks like in the workplace. Um, what we know is just knowing it's important isn't enough. People need options. Um, as you look at um, research on street on uh, and uh, in that side of the equation, um, and the climate surveys that you've put together, council member, um, again, wonderful. Let's also look at how street harassment, online harassment, are impacting employees. Most employers have no idea um, how these two issues are impacting them. Um, 
and are gonna see the same effects in their, in their workforce um, as other folks. Um, lastly, we'd love to see training of 311 and 911 operators on all forms of harassment. Um, and we'd love to see reasonable accommodations for, um, for harassment. Um, some, some different cities around the country have things called sick and safe leave policies that allow people to use sick leave um, to, to secure their own safety and include certain accommodations like working from home um, or, uh, you know, um, changing the hours of their commute, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a whole guidebook on how employers can do that as well. So, sorry to run over. And thank Looking you. <laughs> forward to seeing the guidebook. Yeah. Uh, if you could submit that as sure. part of your testimony. And also, I'm very interested in what you came up with in your work with BuzzFeed, mm -hmm. to the extent that can be submitted uh, as part of your testimony as well. We would welcome it. We have a lot to learn. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah, sounds good. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Allegra Fischel. I'm the executive director of the Gender Equality Law Center. We're a nonprofit legal and advocacy center that works to um, combat gender-based discrimination in all its forms through a variety of different types of initiatives. As I think most people in this room would agree, sexual harassment is one of the most pernicious forms of gender-based discrimination and is not only emotionally devastating to its victims, but often causes them to be pushed out of the job and to lose the benefits for earning a living. Um, just very quickly to try to summarize um, our written testimony, I want to comment very briefly on some of the proposed bills. First, I want to applaud Councilmember Powers' uh, proposed legislation to expand the scope of coverage for sexual harassment victims, which would bring the law in line with the state carve-out, which provides that even, employee, oh, even employers who have a sole employee would be able to bring a claim for sexual harassment. We do a lot of work with do domestic workers and uh, Sexual harassment assault is a huge problem. We also really want to, fo uh, to weigh in on how important some of the preventative measures are that are set forth in these bills because as a longtime litigator who litigates sexual harassment cases, it is much better to prevent the harassment than to be working to try to remedy the damage that it causes after the fact. We appreciate the uh, notice requirement that was proposed by uh, Council Member Cumbo. We do, and we set forth more in our written testimony, have concerns that notices alone are probably not terribly effective. In our experience, they're not posted, they're hidden, and it would be very awkward sometimes to be reading about your rights in front of your harasser. And so we propose that sexual harassment policies be mandated for all private employers. And I'm gonna quickly, quickly go through a couple of other points. Um, we think the mandatory sexual harassment training, I'm not going to even talk about city agencies, for private employers is absolutely key. And we would suggest that all employers with four or more employees rather than 15 be required under the law to, pro to provide these um, trainings to their employees, that the penalties be significantly strengthened, $2,000 for a second offense for other than the tiniest of employers to us does not seem very meaningful. And I can tell you, and I think most people who have litigated these cases will share my opinion, that it is really the um, threat of some serious financial repercussions that often does the trick to bring employers into line. And then I'll just add one other point because I've run out of time, which is that we strongly suggest that the city council and this committee form some type of ad hoc committee that can reach out to a lot of different people to help inform this legislation. We would include community members that could inform the city council about language barriers, about cultural differences. We would include victims who actually had to tackle what are the barriers in the workplace from coming forward, legal advocates that have litigated these cases, and even people like therapists that understand the emotional ramification, and we have a lot more detail in our written testimony. Thank you, that's exactly what we'd like to do. So I'm um, eager for your help. Thank you, we'd like okay. to offer it. 
Thank you. My name is Meredith Mascara. I'm the CEO of the Girl Scouts of Greater New York. Uh, and if you don't know, the Girl Scouts of Greater New York serves 29,000 girls between the ages of 5 and 17 in the five boroughs of New York City. And our program is mostly delivered by 8,000 volunteers, most of them all women who are not just volunteers but are also part of the workforce here in the city as well. So we have launched this year as an advocacy, a year of advocacy uh, for our girls. We teach our girls civic engagements and for them to be able to speak up and use their voice when it comes to issues of their concern. And I can tell you that girls as young as the age of nine have raised sexual harassment as one of their major concerns with us throughout our programming. Um, uh, this means that they are either experienced it themselves or that they know that one of their loved ones has or one of their volunteers who is a mentor near and dear to their heart. So it is, our, it is our duty as an organization to be able to speak on their behalf and on their future to make sure that we provide a safe space for them uh, as an organization and they now expect that to, to be translated into their work experience when they enter the workforce. So on behalf of the girls and the volunteers here in New York City, we thank you for all that you're doing, uh, but let's make sure that uh, uh, that we pass these, uh, these initiatives so that we can protect our girls' space as they become young women in our workforce. That's great. Scouts. Thank you. <laughs> Once again, um, that's great. And that's great to be able to know we can think about you as an advocacy and education. And of course, at any time, if you, need, if you need to discuss this with girls, we have girls who are ready, willing, and able to, uh, to come here and speak about their concerns as well. Let's follow up. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. We're moving on to our next panel from Self Horizon, Blake Johnson. Safe Horizon, is that what I said? What did I say? Who knows? Okay, Safe Horizon. Uh, Blake Johnson, um, Francesca, thank you. <laughs> and you'll introduce yourself from Susan Scatidi from the Fashion Institute and Jeff Trexler. Um, also from the Fashion, I want to say Law Institute. Awesome. Come join us. Look forward to your testimony. We're going to keep to the two-minute clock with apologies. Um, thank you. And especially if you're submitting testimony, know that um, we will all read it. So if you could summarize, we'd appreciate that. So the Fashion Law Institute, want to get us started? Hi, Susan Scafidi, founder and director of the Fashion Law Institute. We're a nonprofit, we're, uh, but we're also based at Fordham University, where we actually both teach. Um, and um, so, just to tell you briefly what we do, it's a range of things academic research, analysis, including those 12 bills, we read them all, uh, advocacy, concrete assistance to individuals, including a clinic, um, and education of the industry as a whole. We work with everybody from enormous multinational companies to trade associations to emerging designers. Um, fashion is uh, actually the second largest industry in New York. So I was delighted that uh, Council Member uh, Lander mentioned it, and of course Com Commissioner Malalas as well. Um, it's also a complex industry, design, manufacturing, retail, runway, the whole range. Um, it's also majority female industry, actually, except in certain job categories. Uh, but at the same time, it's a creative outsider industry, so it, which celebrates traditional rule, celebrates rule breaking, and also is is um, very oriented to physical appearance, of course. So we it's a little bit schizophrenic in some ways. Uh, we have issues with harassment of both women and men, uh, but also very proactive, even pre-Weinstein efforts to, from within the industry and from in companies and organizations within the industry, change these things. And we sort of hope that, and as we've expressed in our testimony, that some of the things that we've come up with, experienced, shared, uh, can be universalized. Um, um, we've heard uh, quite a bit about models recently, and that's something that we've worked on for the past eight years. We helped launch the Model Alliance and so forth. Uh, and that's certainly an important area to, to think about. Uh, but I think we really need to go, if you'll pardon the pun, behind the scenes a little bit to think about individuals throughout the industry that experience harassment. Um, and I just wanted to share with you two examples uh, very quickly. Um, 
from the from uh, people that we've we've encountered and experienced in our work uh, from the dozens if not hundreds of stories that we've heard uh, because it gives a sense of the range of issues we're dealing with um, an attorney who's actually also an immigrant who was in a fashion company experienced such pervasive uh, environmental harassment uh, that 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 individual was eventually pushed out of the company and left the industry altogether all the way down to an individual who was working as an independent contractor um, and he had not the kind of education an attorney had. He had a ticket to New York and a dream um, and was so ashamed at the same sex harassment that he encountered in the industry uh, that when he came to our clinic, his first question was, will anyone uh, see me or know that I'm here? And so we can't continue to lose that kind of talent as people like those 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 folks leave the industry and so i'd like to go throw the uh hearing uh, the, the time over to my colleague uh, jeff trexler who's the associate director of the um uh, of the institute and teaches our fashion ethics course to just quickly summarize our specific recommendations and thank you again. Uh, this is a, a very quick summary of a much longer document, and we'd love to keep working with you in the future. Uh, we have four recommendations, largely centered around the, the problem of stigma. I know we've, you've been talking about how to reduce it and how there can be an interplay between law and culture. One way you can do it is through transparency, and specifically requiring disclosure by all private employers in New York City. Uh, and not just whether they've received internal complaints, but also have there been multiple cl complaints directed at one individual or you know, whoever in the individual may be. And as a, in the process of settlement, are they giving money, or monetary settlements, or are they requiring departure? And I believe that you'd be able to data map that and see some very interesting patterns over time. Uh, we also make recommendations about non-disclosure agreements. We do not recommend banning them because a number of people do not want their story to go public because of the stigma. But if you would remove liability for complainants who breach that, who decide they tell their stories, um, that would be a good, uh, good move to make. We also uh, heartily agree with expanding protection. With independent contractors, we're an industry where you will often have an independent contractor working with an independent contractor so they fall outside the scope of current New York law, and, and or, they're also, or there'll be small employers under four, so we wanna uh, close those loopholes. St stopping stigma is a, is a major, major part of our concern. We want you to, it would be great if there was some way to encourage people to hire troublemakers and also to create incentives not to fire people who bring, uh, to bring these complaints, particularly through, uh, surreptitiously through settlements. And finally, I wanna second the recommendation for a working group. We strongly believe that this conversation should not end here. It should not end with the current proposals. Uh, New York brought this sexual harassment law to the fore. Of, of the nation's consciousness 40 years ago, and now we're in a position to be the innovators and redesign sexual harassment law for, a new, for the 21st century. Uh, and I think it'd be great for New York City to start that conversation right here. Did I mention my scheduler's name and email address? If you could give that again, please, that'd be fantastic. Sure, his name is Ned Terrace, and the email address is nterrace, T-E-R-R-A-C-E, at council.nyc.gov, and you'll see our council will be at the meetings as well. We're eager, eager to learn from you. Wonderful. You know, delighted to part of that conversation. Now, it is. Good afternoon. I'm Francesca Burek, and I'm president and CEO of Fearless Talent Development, and I'm also president of the National uh, Women's Federation of Business and Professional Women in New York City. We're an affiliate of the International uh, Business and Professional Women, and we are in 110 countries. We work very hard on advocacy issues for women, not just here in New York, but around the world. And in my firm, we are uh, primarily focused on women and helping women step into their power and take fearless action like this council is doing with this, um, with this whole issue of sexual harassment and I thank you so much for doing this. I'm gonna focus on um, uh, the training because our expertise as a business and as this women's organization is to really help uh, create cultures where women and other individuals feel respected and can come forth and present complaints and ideas in a meaningful way. 
So I wanted to focus primarily first on the managers and supervisors because they are the ones that are creating the culture in their department or agency. And I think it's really important that whatever experience, training experience any worker is, is receiving, that the supervisors and managers go through that exact training so that they understand what's being said and what employees are going to expect from them. And then there also, of course, has to be a section on supervisors and managers and how to set culture. And most important is not only their responsibility and accountability, but really their communication skills because everything starts and ends with communication and how effectively we can communicate. And that, of course, sets the whole cultural environment and who's going to feel free enough to come by and talk to us and for us to treat them with dignity and respect so that they can feel like they're being heard. So that's the main, and this can't be done online. This has to be done face to face with practice, practice, practice. And um, that's one recommendation. And the second is following this um, experience, this training that all supervisors and managers should go through. This should be publicized so that employees realize that supervisors and managers are now trained. They can listen and hear what's being said and they expect you to come forth if there's something going on in the workplace. So that's really, really important. And the third is, um, I wasn't quite sure. I saw that in the um, training that there were going to be two trainings per year and I wasn't sure if it was the same training for different groups or if it's two different trainings that are gonna be going on. One is the basics and the other is more advanced. But if there is going to be two for, same, for, a, for the same population, there should be different titles <laughs> so that people don't immediately think they're going through the same thing and the training should be different. It should be more advanced one versus the other. And as for a question, I was a little surprised earlier. First of all, I think everyone is really trying their best in city agencies to make things happen, and I applaud them. But something as simple as a question put to people, do you feel that the administration of your department could listen to you, would listen to you, if you went to them with a complaint about sexual harassment, yes or no? And if it's no, why not? And it could be anonymously done. I mean, this is like a really simple thing that can be you know, done. And I'm only too happy to um, lend my advice and counsel on my experience to anything that we're doing. And it's great to see you. The last time I saw you in this situation where it was in 2015 with Martha Burke when we were working on the vendor transparency on board diversity. Yeah, thank you. There we go. I believe it's on. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Blake Johnson. I'm the supervising social worker for Safe Horizons Community Program Helpline. Um, Safe Horizon, we are the nation's leading victim assistance organization and New York's largest provider of services to victims of crime. We are also the country's largest domestic, provide, domestic violence provider at all. Um, our mission is, of course, to provide support, um, prevent violence, and promote justice for victims of crime and abuse and their families and communities. Um, so to just jump right into our, um, how it is that we view sexual violence. So we view sexual harassment and sexual assault as part of the same continuum arising from the same cultural and political factors. As has previously been mentioned here, um, we do view that these are all behaviors that are stemming ultimately from power and control. Um, in the same way that we address these within the lives of the people who reach out to us, we also think it is very important to address these within workplaces. Um, since a lot of statistics have already been mentioned here in the room, to summarize the ones that are a part of the testimony, in addition to all of what other folks have contributed here, um, I think a huge point of the what we have in uh, or what is in this testimony is specifically about how sexual violence strongly impacts people of minority identities. Um, so specifically trans folks, um, uh, gay men, bisexual, and, uh, bisexual men and women, lesbians, um, and also folks of many different um, immigration and uh, racial groups are all strongly impacted by sexual violence both in the community and in the workplace. Um, in terms of recommendations, um, um, regarding best practices um, in preventing sexual harassment, um, certainly we 
absolutely recommend strong policies in which to address sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and we also want to note that though a strong policy can be in place, the strong policy is absolutely meaningless if it is not in if it's not accompanied by exceptionally strong culture within an organization that is also willing to enforce the policy and work with it. Um, without this, um, the policy does not mean anything. Um, we, also want to, um, we also want to give light to um, a lot of other factors that are involved within uh, victimization and things that should be thought about within policy. Um, and specifically, this is uh, related to trauma that victims of sexual violence might experience and how policy should also be formed in a way that responds to the fact that um, people who have been through sexual violence um, might need different types of accommodations uh, to deal with the trauma that they're going through in order to be able to um, you know, file or engage in any type of policy or process that an organization implements. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your expertise and your testimony. Um, the next panel we're bringing up is Sarah uh, Braff Braffman from A Better Balance, um, Jaren Arifa, uh, Rachel Piazza, and Paige Sarban. And I just want to thank you all for your patience. I know it's getting late. We have a couple more panels, but we really appreciate your being here. Um, great. If we could, um, Sarah, if you could start, start us off, that'd be great. Just introduce yourself and try to give the highlights. Thank you. Is that better? Okay, thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, I so appreciate your leading this effort and A Better Balance appre appreciates your leading this effort. Um, so I'm Sarah Brofman, I'm an attorney with A Better Balance. Um, we work to combat um, many forms of discrimination in the workplace, but obviously gender-based discrimination is one of them, um, especially discrimination faced by women of color in, in New York City and low-wage workers. Um, we very much applaud this very strong, very robust package of bills. I'm going to take us through a few um, recommendations that we have to strengthen both the, the legislation um, as it's been introduced and some recommendations that we have for additional legislation that we'd like to see come out of the council. So the, the three um, points that I want to raise in terms of the uh, introduced legislation is the first one it relates to the reporter contracting um, right now the bill um, really just talks about reporting on policies we think that it's very important to have much stronger um, enforcement over city contractors who violate the human rights law and uh, in our testimony suggest multiple ways to do that so really two prongs of it. First, um, addressing reporting requirements that they have, um, and the state is taking this on as well to really hold state contractors accountable for reporting, complaints, violations, et cetera. And then the second piece is really, um, you know, not providing state contract or city contracts rather to contractors who are violating the human rights law. And another piece of this is um, a lot of contractors and a lot of private employers we see put mandatory arbitration clauses into their contracts. Um, and something that the city can do is to say, you know, we won't contract with you if you're going to put in those types of clauses. The second um, piece I wanted to address in terms of the introduced legislation is on the trainings. Um, wow, that time really does go by fast. So the in terms of the trainings, um, we think there should be qualification standards for the trainers, both for city and, um, and private employers. Um, and the third piece of it is that the current definition of sexual harassment, which has been defined in the case law, is very broad. Um, and we wouldn't want the legislation, for instance, legislation around extending the statute of limitations to unwittingly um, narrow the definition that um, has been set forth in the case law. Um, and then in terms of the proposals that aren't here but that we'd like to see, um, the first one is around pre-employment non-disclosure agreements that private employers should not um, muzzle employees signing an employment contract. Um, and the second one that I really want to flag is also industry-specific legislation. So we've heard from people in different industries. Um, 
But there are, especially in low-wage industries, very targeted legislation that can help combat sexual harassment. So for instance, in Chicago, um, they just passed an order in, ordinance around hotel workers. In LA, um, there was a movement around janitors. In California, passed legislation around janitors. Um, and so really to look at specific industry legislation that can help um, combat sexual harassment for vulnerable low-wage workers and workers in male-dominated industries. Um, this, the other piece I want to echo is strengthening protections for independent contractors. That includes changing the definition of independent contractors, changing the liability standard, and doing very strong public education for independent contractors. Um, and I'll leave it there because um, the, the rest of it is um, outlined in the rest of our testimony. Yeah, and we look forward to working with you. We have it, we you. follow up. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Rachel Piazza. I teach uh, women's and gender, am I in there? Yeah, just yeah. speak into the mic a little okay. bit closer. Sure. Thank you. So uh, my name is Rachel Piazza. I uh, teach women's and gender studies at the university level. I have written for numerous publications about the spectrum of gender-based uh, discrimination, and I'm the founder of Feminist Self-Defense. It's a program that uh, uses an evidence-based model that has been shown to decrease incidents of sexual harassment and violence. Um, I know from my work that women thrive when they're empowered with uh, tools and strategies to confront sexual violence. Um, and I teach women not only to defend themselves physically, but to interrupt incremental boundary violations as they occur. Um, and research shows that women who complete this type of self-defense training are 50 to 60 percent less likely to encounter any type of sexual harassment or assault. Um, and so while it's important that we don't hold women responsible for these types of uh, actions against them for sexual harassment, um, it's also super important that we empower women with the tools that they need to respond um, and address them front on. So I would hope that uh, this type of training could be uh, considered in the future. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal, thank you so much for your leadership on this topic, um, for holding this hearing and allowing me to submit testimony. My name is Jerry Narifa. I spearheaded the sexual harassment policy for all of CUNY while undocumented. Before our work, uh, there was no uniform policy for all of CUNY uh, for the half a million students and staff. Um, when we worked on the CUNY policy, we looked at the spectrum of violence um, and discrimination that incorporated sexual harassment, assault, domestic violence, and stalking. Because as many of the speakers said, sexual harassment is the most, and violence are the most extreme forms of sex discrimination. Now, as a proud American citizen, I've continued my work in ending discrimination. I've designed, led, and evaluated trainings for hundreds on ending sexual harassment. A recent New York Times article confirmed what I know from my own experience in both the nonprofit and corporate sector. Most sexual harassment trainings are not effective. They can actually make things worse because they're most often led by HR staff who don't understand the nuanced dynamics of this form of sex discrimination. The Times article explained what does work, which is bystander intervention trainings in person. Online training is not effective in this context. In closing, I hope you'll create a citywide policy that looks at the spectrum of gender-based discrimination that goes beyond sexual harassment. And I hope you'll spell out mandatory in-person training led by experts and not necessarily HR advocates that all city agencies must provide. Thank you. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank you for this groundbreaking and essential hearing and for your proposed legislation regarding sexual harassment. Um, my name is Paige Sanborn. I'm a daughter, a sister, a mother of two, and a child psychologist. Um, I'm grateful to be here today in all of my roles as we are living in a daunting era of escalating violence, from bullying to assault. 
Last year, I identified and joined a New York-based technology organization, or a data and technology organization called Bridget. Bridget has created an extraordinary digital platform that allows for easy reporting, icon-based in 60 seconds only, um, that maps behavioral data in real time. The secure and confidential platform was created for K-12 schools, um, but it is, they have worked for two summers with students from Steps to End Violence um, Steps to End Family Violence and Relationship Abuse Program, RAP. The Brooklyn Middle School that we've piloted in um, over the past four years has seen 50% decrease in bullying incidences and an increase in positive school culture and climate. Bridget's platform technology can now be used in settings at college campuses, private organizations, government agencies. We've developed apps and websites um, and changed up the platform to be able to um, accommodate other needs. The platform is web enabled from any device and it is an app, um, both for an Android and an Apple. The platform features 24 seven reporting application in which all at risk behaviors are featured, including 25 forms of sexual harassment from cat calling um, to unwanted intimacy, inappropriate sexual displays, misconduct, all the way to rape. The notification is immediate and the reports are confidential. Um, they can be anonymous. Um, but the ones that are within a system are confidential and sent to whomever the governing body or staff members or agencies would like to select. The platform also addresses general harassment and hostile work environments and can be customized for any entity to track additional behaviors in order to have a clear understanding. The only other thing I want to add, most important thing, is that we also have a multilingual resource center. So any, and it's an um, artificial intelligence based um, platform, so anytime anything is touched, anytime the um, platform is touched, it is gathered, and so if I were to report something, I'm given information to help me. If I'm raped, I'm given, I'm sent to hotlines, I'm sent um, restorative techniques, books, legal definitions of what happened, uh, and I think that's a really important piece of it. There's a ton more that goes on with it, but in terms of time, um, you have the testimony to read the rest. It was just great. Yeah. Thank you. We're yeah. going to follow up with you. Really yeah, appreciate absolutely. that. Okay, the next panel, um, we have Christina Chang from Planned Parenthood of New York, Emily Kadar from the National Institute for Reproductive Health, Zoe Ridolfi Starr uh, from the Sexuality Education Alliance of New York City, and Manish Srivas. Srivas, oh, I'm so close. Srivatasan, okay, thank you. From the Peer Health Exchange, thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Christina Chang and I'm Vice President of, Public, of uh, Planned Parenthood of New York City and thank you to the committee chairs Rosenthal and Eugene and the speaker for convening today's hearing. Uh, PPNYC has been a leading health and education provider in New York City for more than 100 years and reaches more than 25,000 New Yorkers annually, both youth and adult, through our, our youth and education, adult education programs. All of our health curricula include a healthy relationship and consent component and seeks to create an affirming space for all members of our community to thrive. In this political moment, pu public conversations on sexual harassment are more important than ever. The hashtag MeToo movement has brought to light the extent to which sexual harassment, assault, and the devaluing of women pervades our society. No workplace or institution is free from these realities, and we're just beginning to take a hard look at the societal systems in place that enable such continued abuse. We applaud the council for taking an important step in convening this hearing to examine the gaps that persist in workplaces across New York City and to begin to act on opportunities for change. In order for employees to be able to do their jobs effectively, they need to feel safe, and they need to feel their employer stands with them and values their well-being. As a leading health educator, PPMYC knows firsthand how important education and prevention is to addressing sexual harassment. Our staff provides workshops and training to adults, caregivers, parents, and professionals because people of all ages require learning around healthy relationships, consent, and respectful communication. PPMYC supports a call to require anti-sexual harassment training in our workplaces so employees know their rights when it comes to sexual harassment and assault and are equipped with the tools and knowledge to identify and report harassment. 
Conversely, managers and employers need training to understand their responsibilities in preventing sexual harassment and the measures they can take to respond to and address complaints. As we see more individuals come forward, we need to ensure employers have the support and resources to be able to report without being subjected to undue retaliation or retribution. However, these resources should not be limited to places of employment. New Yorkers, particularly women and transgender and gender nonconforming individuals, experience sexual harassment, I'll be quick, long before they enter the workforce. We need to address the extent of sexual harassment that we experience in our daily lives and take steps to create environments to help prevent harassment from occurring in the first place. And the way to do this, a core component of prevention, requires an increased commitment to comprehensive sexuality education. Um, research has consistently shown that comprehensive sex ed works. Positive youth development education that focuses on the physical, mental, emotional, and social dimensions of sexuality is critical in helping young people make health-promoting decisions and can help shift broader cultural ideas about gender, power, and sexuality, challenging the deeply embedded culture of sexual harassment unearthed by the Me Too movement. Reports of harassment and assault are not new, but this new renewed awareness and call for action, we have an unprecedented opportunity to move forward large scale changes. These efforts must include workplace education resources and support services, but they need to start well before individuals enter the workforce. We applaud the council's commitment to addressing sexual harassment in the workplace and urge the city to advance comprehensive sexuality education citywide as a powerful tool to shift the prevailing culture that enables sexual harassment and abuse to one that builds caring communities and institutions that respects the identities and rights of all of us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zoe Rodolfi Starr and I serve as the co-chair of policy for the Sexuality Education Alliance of New York City. Thank you. Um, for convening this hearing and for supporting uh, the bills being discussed this afternoon. The Sexuality Education Alliance, or CNIC, advocates for comprehensive K-12 sex education that meets the national sexuality education standards for all New York City youth. Our coalition includes high school students and parents, educators, direct service providers, and advocacy organizations. We commend the efforts of City Council to strengthen our city's response to sexual harassment in the workplace. As many have articulated today, Harassment in the workplace is a pervasive and urgent issue in New York. And it's no wonder, because each year our city allows another generation of young people to enter the workforce without providing the sexuality education they need to make healthy, responsible choices in the workplace and beyond. While this package of bills offers some promising solutions, there is a glaring gap. How do we effectively change the culture and prevent sexual harassment in the first place? Children begin to learn about bodies, consent, and boundaries at a very young age. With early and ongoing educational interventions, young people can learn how to responsibly navigate their own sexuality and to respect that of others. They can learn skills like how to responsibly navigate their own sexuality and respect others. When these students leave school, they are better equipped to navigate the workplace, more likely to identify and feel comfortable reporting unacceptable behavior, and less likely to engage in harmful behaviors themselves. Without comprehensive sexuality education, young people are often left to absorb their information from damaging representations in the media, ill-informed peers, or teachers who are inadequately prepared. These young people will eventually enter the workforce too, and a one-hour training video will not be sufficient to help them unlearn discriminatory or inappropriate attitudes. In order to truly eradicate sexual harassment, New York City must begin to prioritize comprehensive K-12 sexuality education. Currently, the Department of Education requires only one semester of health education uh, in middle school and another in high school, and the Office of School Wellness Program calls for a portion of each of these semesters to cover co sexuality education. This is the extent of our city's sexuality education requirement, and it is wholly insufficient. Research demonstrates that early and ongoing education is far more effective in changing norms, attitudes, and behaviors than one-off lessons. Additionally, the dearth of qualified health teachers and the DOE's utter failure to effectively enforce even the existing mandate means that many schools are not complaining, complying with the minimal requirement. According to DOE's own data, almost half of eighth graders who graduated in 2016 did not receive a single semester of health during middle school, and only 7.6 of all health education instructors have attended any training on sexuality education in the last two years. The prevalence of sexual harassment in our city's workplaces is a consequence of our failure to educate generations of New Yorkers about boundaries, consent, and respect. While we do believe the measures being discussed today have the potential to address sexual harassment, they will only be effective if coupled with a robust plan to expand comprehensive sexuality education across the city. 
In order to effectively prevent sexual harassment, New York City must achieve compliance with and strengthen our sexuality education policy. In pursuit of this goal, CNIC has, de has developed a set of recommendations in collaboration with teachers, students, school principals, and other stakeholders. If We've I could just ask, all of that here. is in here, yes. right? If you could just wrap up. Yes, thanks. thank you. Uh, once again, we appreciate your leadership uh, and look forward to the opportunity to work with you in the future. Thank you, Chairwoman, and the rest of the council members for holding this important hearing today and giving us the opportunity to speak. My name is Emily Kadar, and I'm here today representing the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Uh, I'm also here as a member of the Sexuality Education Alliance in New York City, which all of my colleagues at the table are as well. Um, the Me Too movement has illuminated the sad fact that sexual harassment and gender inequity are pervasive in all industries and environments, including schools. New York City must be a leader in addressing this insidious problem. The bills before you today, which include initiatives like sexual harassment assessment and anti-harassment trainings at city agencies and private employers, greater transparency reporting and public information about sexual harassment, and the expansion and strengthening of our city's human rights law are all steps in the right direction and demonstrate how seriously the council is taking this issue. But we also urge the council to confront sexual harassment at its earliest stages and consider how we are educating our young people on healthy relationships, consent, respect, and communication. Since 2011, the New York City Department of Education has had the requirement, which you just heard Zoe describe. Um, and as we all know, comprehensive sexuality education includes vital information about the prevention of unintended pregnancy, HIV, AIDS, and STIs but it also provides a foundational understanding of the boundaries, bodily autonomy, and consent. This knowledge can help prevent child sexual abuse, teen dating violence, bullying, and sexual harassment. We at NIRH believe that the current sexuality education policy does not go far enough. Uh, the DOE has the ability to mandate via Chancellor's regulation and its own wellness policy a comprehensive age-appropriate sexuality education policy uh, that reflects the national standards for all students, kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, I've included the roadmap that lays this out with my testimony. Um, we will only be able to combat these issues if we seek the roots of the problem and confront them early and often. NIRH looks forward to continuing to work with the council to ensure that all New Yorkers, including women, LGBTQ individuals, and young people are safe, healthy, and protected from sexual harassment and violence. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Rosenthal, uh, for the opportunity to speak um, and for your leadership on this really important issue. Uh, my name is Manish Srivatsava. I'm a program manager uh, with Peer Health Exchange, a nonprofit that trains college students to deliver a skills-based and culturally responsive um, health curriculum to underserved and under-resourced high schools. Um, so we really applaud the package of bills that have been discussed here today um, to combat sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, and education about sexual harassment, uh, we believe, must start before someone actually enters the workplace. Uh, one in 10 of New York City's public high school students have experienced sexual dating violence in the last 12 months. Uh, PHE believes the ideal and best place to begin conversations about respect, communication, and consent is in our K through 12 schools. A lack of quality health education leads to a lack of understanding of the ability and the ability to navigate consensual relationships. We partner with 53 high schools across New York City and reach over 5,600 high school students uh, um, this year who would not otherwise be receiving health education. In a recent evaluation, we found that young people who received our programming were 20% more likely than their peers to have an accurate understanding of sexual consent. We know that sexual harassment is an issue that disproportionately affects women, and it's an issue that, dis that is disproportionately perpetrated by men. And so, if we must critically engage with how we are discussing sexuality education, uh, we must also critically engage with how we're specifically dealing with sexual education with young men. In a culture where toxic masculinity and the misunderstanding of social and power dynamics are ubiquitous, there's a call to action for not just comprehensive sexuality education, but also health education that covers and addresses mental health stigmas for men and the impacts of substance use. We commend the City Council's commitment to address the current rates of sexual harassment in the workplace and beyond, and we urge them to advance uh, comprehensive K-12 sexual health education for young people across the city. This is so 
uh, terrific. And I really appreciate the roadmap that all of you stapled to your testimony. It's quite clear. Sure. So thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Um, next, we're going to hear from Ethan Geringer Semeth from Citizens Union, uh, Corrine Tracy from Community Service Society of New York, Rebecca Litwin for from the Girls for Gender Equity and Brittany uh, Brathwaite from, also from the Girls for Gender Equity. We really appreciate your time and your testimony. Can I ask you to start? Make sure the red button is on. Good morning, uh, Chair Rosenthal. Um, my name is Ethan Geringer Samoth, and I'm the Public Policy and Program Manager at Citizens Union, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, Citizens Union is an independent, nonpartisan civic organization of New Yorkers that promotes good government and advances democratic reform in our city and state. As part of our mission, we work to ensure that public officials and their staff meet their responsibilities to the people and uphold the public trust. We feel strongly that guaranteeing a safe, empowering, and dignified workplace for all New Yorkers, especially women, and especially women of color, and especially those working in city government, is at the basis of that effort. Um, the reason that we're testifying today is because this is not only a labor rights issue, it's not only a public safety issue, it's also a good government issue when sexual harassment goes unaddressed in city government. Um, it's a matter of democratic representation, broadly speaking. Um, how many voices have been silenced due to sexual harassment over the many years that it's gone um, relatively, and I say relatively, uh, not lightly, um, unaddressed? Uh, so at this early stage in the review of the city's sexual harassment policy, uh, we offer just three recommendations. One, that the review is conducted with transparency, um, that it takes the detailed public reporting of sexual harassment metrics seriously, um, and finally, to that end, um, that reporting should include other information on other factors like race and age and level of employment um, so that we can take into account that the experiences of women are not always the same and that uh, women who are at the intersections of other uh, axes of advantage and disadvantage are um, taken into account. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal. My name is Becca Litwin. Um, I'm currently pursuing my master's in social work and working at Girls for Gender Equity, an organization challenging structural forces that work to obstruct the freedom, full expression, and rights of girls, transgender, and gender nonconforming youth of color. We are also proud members of the Dignity in Schools campaign and Scenic, who just shared. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Sexual harassment in the workplace has long been an oppressive truth, as has the reality of sexual violence in the workplace of our young people, school. Through a participatory action research project, we worked with over 100 girls and TGNC youth of color throughout New York City to identify barriers to education and envision the schools they want, need, and deserve. Through this process, we learned that one in three of the participants reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment in school. One young person described their experience sharing, quote, in elementary school, people would catcall me in halls, make sexual comments, and I didn't report it because I didn't want to make a fuss over it. This quote highlights the ways that some of our PAR participants not only experience sexual harassment, but are also not reporting it or are afraid to report it. Our schools recreate American societal culture in which sexual harassment is a normalized and underreported part of the school experience. As a city, we have a duty and opportunity to change this story. To this end, we're calling on City Council to enforce a stronger implementation of Title IX, the Dignity Act, the Respect for All, to support the mental, emotional, and physical health of all young people. There are existing local, state, and federal laws that are intersectional in nature. However, they're not given the adequate uh, fiscal and implementation resources they require in order to be fully and successfully implemented. While the DOE has hired a gender equity coordinator who has gotten nearly 1,000 people trained on topics related to sexual harassment, it's not enough. Currently, New York City has 1.1 million students and only one Title IX coordinator. We urgently need a Title IX coordinator at every field uh, support office who can both address sexual harassment and also work with schools on creating cultures of consent. 
Additionally, we need to divest from NYPD in our schools and invest in creating the num uh, increasing the number of trained and supervised guidance counselors and social workers who are equipped to connect students with a community-based, culturally responsive, survivor-led, trauma-informed support. We need to make sure there's comprehensive in-school support for students who are survivors of sexual violence. Finally, we must recognize that gender-based violence is a spectrum and sexual harassment is only one piece of that. Me Too is a movement to end all forms of gender-based violence and this is a movement of which GG has been a part for over 15 years. Uh, we can't afford to have, have this conversation end at sexual harassment and workplace policies alone. Uh, thank you for your continued support and the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much for your leadership and the opportunity to speak today. My name is Brittany Brathwaite. I am the Organizing and Innovation Manager at Girls for Gender Equity. Becca already said what that was. Um, and so I want to echo those points that sexual harassment in the workplace is a pressing issue, but it is not limited to workplace settings, and it has a significant um, impact on youth attending schools every day. Becca uplifted a report that we recently did. We did a similar study 10 years ago and found the same thing. And so we are not really seeing much of a change. Um, we know that the reports of sexual harassment are not novel and many young people have had no education in New York City public schools as to what sexual harassment or assault is and how they can prevent it from occurring. Um, in our recent report, our young people expressed an overwhelming desire to have comprehensive sex education in grades K through 12, as uplifted by folks on the scenic panel. Um, comprehensive sex education is an extremely effective way to ensure that young people have the information to make self-determined decisions about their bodies and their lives. Um, the less, there's lessons ranging from bodily autonomy, respect, elements of healthy relationships, anti-bullying measures, bystander interventions, consent, safe sexual practices, etc. Um, and we also know that while education offers us a powerful tool to transform how young people learn about themselves and each other, we cannot solely place the onus on young people for ending sexual harassment and assault. Um, when we asked young people in our study to indicate whether they had ever reported sexual harassment, regardless of whether it happened to them directly, 97% of youth said they had not reported it. When participants were prompted to elaborate on their responses, several themes emerged, the most common being that sexual harassment was simply accepted as part of what is meant to be at school. Sexual harassment and gender-based violence cannot be an acceptable thread in the fabric of our education system. Young people have to attend school. It is a law. They cannot, um, they cannot leave or quit. Um, many workplaces have human resources department, a union, or an outside agency that employees can turn to to report sexual harassment. And while these practices have a long way to go, there are often more clarity and process around reporting for adults in the workplace. In New York City, students have one person, the Title IX coordinator, who in our experience, most students don't even know who that is. One person to handle reports, prevention, and intervention of any issues related to sexual harassment for 1.1 million students. We've done the math, the ratio is off. It would appear that if we're taking this issue seriously, we would have allotted more resources and people power to ensure that schools are truly safe for all young people. Um, our vision, along with yours, is to create safe and supportive learning environments, and our efforts must include education, knowing one's rights, support resources, and the full implementation of policies created to protect young people in school environments. So here we ask to advance comprehensive sex education citywide and make a serious investment in policies that protect and support students for sexual harassment like Title IX and the Dignity Act. Thank you. I really appreciate your bringing up those connections. So thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to come in. And as all, we appreciate good government. So thank you for making it clear it's part of the definition. Our next panel is Isadora Finkelstein from the Center for Anti-Violence Education, um, Talia Evans from the Center for Anti-Violence Education, um, Juvisela Castro, also from the Center for, I see we have a whole thing going here. This is good. And Jacqueline Castro, also from the Center for Anti-Violence Education. You're our last panel, women. Great. Thank you for staying all the way to the end. If you have copies of your testimony, um, terrific. You can hand it over to the Sergeant at Arms. All right, whoever wants to start, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Izzy Finkelstein. I'm the program coordinator for uh, school and community violence prevention at the Center for Anti-Violence Education. Um, I'm gonna leave most of the talking to the brilliant young people on either side of me, but 
a little bit about CAE. So the Center for Anti-Violence Education builds strength to stop violence. The organization was founded in 1974 and for 44 years has been working throughout New York City with schools, nonprofit organizations, and other community groups to prevent, interrupt, and heal from violence. We work primarily with girls, women, um, LGBTQ and trans and gender non-conforming people um, and others who are at risk of violence because of their identities. Um, we are based in Council District 38 and are very thankful uh, to City Council for funding much of the work that we do. And I'm gonna turn it over to these two. Lander. Mm -hmm. All right. um, hello and thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Jacqueline and I'm 16 and I go to, I'm a sophomore at High School of Telecommunications, Arts and Technology in Bay Ridge. And I'm also a peer educator at the Center for Anti-Violence Education, CAE. And in, at CAE we learn self-defense and we also learn how to be upstanders. We get to teach others and about these skills as well. We also come together as a community to break all kinds of cycles of violence. And when learning about and teaching self-defense, we talk about how to prepare yourself if you experience sexual harassment. We teach people how to use their voices, like how to say no and create boundaries if someone approaches you in a way you don't like. And like from like some brief, brief background of myself is like, like nobody likes to get harassed and no matter how many times you walk down the street, whether you have on a dress or pants, you still don't feel safe. I'm not saying it's your fault for wearing what you wanted to wear today, but because people who see you think it is okay to sexually harass you. Even if it's not physical harassment, verbal harassment plays an even bigger role and not much is being done. We learn a lot how to, be, how to defend ourselves, but what about people who harass? I want to walk outside and not change blocks because one block isn't safe enough. I feel like schools should teach and have more awareness about sexual harassment. I know that people at my high school or any high school or even middle school are aware of what sexual harassment is and that it is wrong, but they aren't aware of how badly sexual harassment could trigger someone because either they're experiencing it at home with friends or every day. I know if schools like mine had more policies about sexual harassment or posters like a Say with no sexual harassment, it would change the point of view a lot of, of a lot of people. Thank you. Wait, I can do this. Okay, it's on. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Juvi Sella. I am 14 years old, and I am a freshman at Fort Hamilton High School. I'm also a peer educator at the Center for Anti-Violence Education, and. Part of my job as a peer educator is to teach girls in the Rising Strong program at MS88. We teach girls some physical self-defense moves in case they were in a situation in which they needed to defend themselves. But we also mention things like sex trafficking and sexual harassment for them to be aware that stuff like this goes on. I feel this is important because when I was in middle school, I didn't know much about sexual harassment and how to defend myself or try to prevent it. From experience, I know that sexual harassment is a problem at schools. For example, at my old middle school, there was a boy who touched a girl inappropriately, and he just got suspended. But do they really learn anything when they're suspended? He should have to learn how something like that affects the person who was harassed. I feel like schools should have programs like CAE to teach others about what sexual harassment is, how to use your voice and defend yourself, and how to care for themselves. After experiencing sexual harassment, knowing that girls like me are being informed about how to fight back against sexual harassment makes me feel good, like we are doing something about it and we won't stay and do nothing. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you both so much for coming here to testify. You know, today has been a little bit of a uh, eye-opening experience for everyone who is here today to learn about what the city does and doesn't do. And the last three panels really have been talking about what we need to do in, um, in our schools. And after hearing you, I have to say I feel there's hope. Um, so this was just the perfect way to end today's hearing. I really want to thank you for coming. 
and thank everyone uh, and folks who stuck around. Thank you very much. Um, and especially to the committee councils, uh, Minta, and help me. Baltis Meharis. Baltis. Baltis. Okay. So um, I'll get there. And, um, and of course, Sean Fitzpatrick, thank you so much. Are you humiliated that I couldn't pronounce your name? Okay. I'll work on it. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you for the preparation for this hearing. You guys did a great job. I really appreciate everyone's effort. Today was a long day. Thank you. This hearing is closed.